I'll move to find the premature public knowledge regarding confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the select board would clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage and further move that we enter executive session to discuss confidential attorney-client communications made for the purpose of providing professional legal services to the select board under Title I, Sections 313A1F of the Vermont Statutes and invite Town Attorney David Rue, Public Works Director Bruce Hoare, and Town Manager Eric Wells to join. All those in favor? Aye. 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 your point being is that before we start making changes that could affect the future in some situations we should wait for the 2025 growth plan be, or town plan to be put in place yes. right. um. yeah I guess my, my thought is that it also says at the beginning of the following was noted and or discussed mm -hmm. it wasn't these bullet points aren't articulating like what was agreed to um, yeah no I agree with that it's just that you can't really follow something that hasn't been developed yet yeah yet, but, okay um, so what would you considered how about that Have a 2025 town plan should be considered Did that that's works for my recollection of your point that okay. yeah. Okay with people? Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Gene. Two good points. Okay. Uh, if nothing else, then page three. I think under uh, item number 10, the town manager report, the uh, third bullet, and it talks about the Vermont Buildings and Grounds Division. There is no such thing as the Buildings and General Services Department. like that's one that we've seen a few times <laughs> for whatever reason. <laughs> okay. Anything else on page three? Okay. So, subject to those modifications, all those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Okay. Next, public comment. Um, this would be the time for anybody in the room or participating remotely to speak on any issue, um, whether it's on the agenda or not. If you uh, want to wait for an agenda item, that might be more appropriate, but it's your right to speak now if you wish to. Um, so let me ask, is there anybody in the room that wishes to make a public comment? Can you come up and state your name? I have just a summary I want to talk about here. 
Okay. Sure. Thank Thanks, you. Around. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Gamper. I live in um, Pine and Williamson. Uh, Ron Bliss, Slam Flight Plane in Williamson. So I wanted to talk just a couple minutes about the um, the agenda item on the temporary event ordinance coming up tonight. Um, I guess the concern is that the way the temporary event ordinance is written right now, it's a one size fits all. And I think the residential district is different enough that it deserves to have its own subsection of the ordinance. You know, for example, the proposal is to increase the number of people attending from 25 to 40 to trigger it. In a residential district, even 25, an event of 25 people is a lot. You know, if you look at our streets, there's no place to park off-site in any of the houses. So you're either going to have people parking on one side of the street, up and down, um, other neighbor's house, or you're going to have people parking on both sides of the street, and that becomes a public safety issue because the fire truck and the ambulance, those kinds of vehicles will never be able to pass. And this is lamplight acres, and we actually have a, I'll call it a shoulder, but it's people's lawn. And people park on the street, they typically park on people's lawn, but the other developments have curbs. So they are really inflexible as to how far cars can move over. Um, the, you know, it, it, the, the use, the, the kinds of things that would qualify for the temporary event permit, you know, you talk about festivals, parties, carnivals, tent sales. All of those things would generate a fair number of people that never would, it just never would work in a residential district. We have, um, the, the one exception maybe is celebrations, because that would tend to be more of a focus, you know, like a graduation party or something like that. It's not where you're gonna have people from outside coming in. You're gonna have a number of known people. I mean, parking is still gonna be an issue. Because even if someone had, even if even if the limit's 25, even if half those people, talk, even if those people come two cars per, uh, two people per car, that's 12 cars. I mean, you're not going to be able to park 12 cars comfortably in the neighborhood anyway. Um, the, the other thing about it is the way it's written, it allows monthly events. A temporary event permit can be for a monthly event. I can't see in a residential area how anything that fits the character of the area and it complies with the zoning ordinance for the residential area is gonna be monthly. You're not gonna have carnivals, you're not gonna do a tent sale. Tent sale is like a commercial thing, it's retail sales. None of that stuff is allowed in a residential district. If you look at um, what the ordinance, I, I, oh, it's chapter 20, says about um, yard sales. Yard sales, a residence, yard sales, you're only allowed to have two a year in Williston. And I think that's much more reasonable for a resident, you know, residential district for a temp temporary event than to have a monthly thing potentially impacting all the neighbors all the time. Um, the, the other area is, um, I, I guess I'll call it the, the, and I understand why it's there, the whole idea of having some kind of flexibility and discretion rather than, um, you know, really firm deadlines and all. I get all that. But I think you need to be careful with the whole discretion thing because if there's too much discretion, it becomes a really slippery slope. And you can't do things like, notify all of the people within 500 feet in a timely manner. You know, there was a, um, a temporary event permit issued um, in the fall on October 13th for an event that happened on October 15th. There was no time for the town to mail letters. The applicant was told, well, let your neighbors know. The applicant never let the neighbors know. So two days after the permit was issued, the neighbors were faced with cars and traffic throughout the day. So I think 
I think it's like 45 days and then they have two de 10 days to respond. Well, if you have 45 days to, you have, you have to apply 45 days before the event. If the application is incomplete, the town has, can ask questions. The applicant has 10 days to ask the question. Well, if 45 days come and suddenly it's a week before the town asks the question and the person takes 10 weeks, you're almost three weeks out or three weeks into that 45 day period. So I think, I think discretion is something, I mean, you just have to be careful about it. It can't be a blanket, any exception is okay at the discretion of the town manager or whoever. Um, so the notification thing, um, right now it says anybody within 500 feet of the event location has to be notified. The applicant has to identify who the houses are, give the names of the town, and the town sends the letters. Well, I, I think again, if we're gonna mail the letters for all that to happen, it has to be more timely. And there's a suggestion in the ordinance to reduce it, uh, to have some flexibility on whether we're gonna do 500 in the rural district or not in the rural district. I think even if it's a lot 500 feet away, depending on what the person in the ag rural district is planning, it could be noise, it could generate a ton of traffic on what is usually a smaller road. And I think the people around it, the abutters and the people around it within 500 feet need to know. You can't assume neighbors are gonna to talk to neighbors and all everything's gonna be worked out on the side. Um, the last point I have is just, um, you know, the whole permit, they talk about permit enforcement and permit revocation and all. The town doesn't have a mechanism for that. You can put in the ordinance whatever you want about, well, if you don't do this, we're gonna revoke your permit. If you, don't, if you don't follow your permit, we're gonna fine you. How's that happen? It can't fall on the neighbors and the abutters to be the reporters to the town, which basically is what happens now. That puts the neighbors in a difficult spot. That creates animosity between the applicant and the neighbors, and it gets ugly. It gets ugly. It's not the neighbor's responsibility to do the town's work. If you don't have an enforcement mechanism, why have any ordinances at all? Um, the other th and there's a couple of other things I put in the, the notes that are going around. I mean, I just think, um, you need to think about splitting the residential district out separately. It can't be a one size fits all. The residential district is way too different than any other district in town. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to add one more point about the parking. Um, in our neighborhood, they came through and they put in uh, those were the drainage ditches, stormwater swells. Well, that prevents you from not being able to, in a good portion of the neighborhood, to even pull off the road. Because if you pull in, you may not get out. Um, so that leads to the narrowing, and some of them are across from each other. You know, it's not a, it's not a perfect world where I could, you know, somebody can pull up on their front yard because they can't. It just, there's nothing there to do it. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. If you decide to go forward, when would the public hearing be? Um, well, we're going to vote on setting the public hearing tonight. I guess I'm not quite sure when the, it would be. Is that, do you need like a 45 day time or something you have to run them? Thursday, I think. Yeah, yeah I anticipate um, a July select board meeting. Okay. <coughs> Great, thank you. Yeah, thank thank you. you. Those are very good, well thought comments. Thank you. They, they're really, some really good things. Okay. Um, public comment. It looks like nobody else in the room. Unless does anybody in the room have a further public comment? Otherwise, we'll ask if there's somebody on Zoom. Nope. nope. Only staff on Zoom. Only staff. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up, interviews and appointments. Michael. Hey. So, Michael Vance. Yep. Um, being interviewed for the position of representative for the Chittenden Communications Union District. Um, so welcome. Thank you. Um, if I can just ask you to give a little blurb uh, about yourself, and then um, if board members have questions, um, we'll go to that. So. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Like I said, my name is Mike Vance. I 
I'm a Wilson resident for the Lower Southbridge. And for my entire professional career, I have ended up building nothing but broadband access networks. And when I, I am maybe unfortunately deeply intimate with the CUV process in my professional capacity. And when I saw Williston had decided to enter into the game, well, I'm a resident, resident and I thought, well, I know this, I should volunteer. So I'm volunteering to, sorry, <laughs> I'm volunteering to be a representative if you'd like me. The, the details of this sort of business is incredibly boring and ad nauseum and <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm brief and so if you have questions about the process or what I would add, feel free to ask and I just don't want to torture well, anyone with the details of this. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming forward. Um, questions from the board? Yes, um, my question really relates to, so you work for Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Telecom. That's correct. So um, are there any anticipated conflicts between your professional career and you know, your role on um, this board? I really hope not. We've taken on enough of these. <laughs> um, so if there was, I would have to step out. Our service territory does include a teeny tiny bit of Williston. Um, so depending on the way these CUTs develop, you could end up requesting services from my company anyways. So I just would not be, I would have to just let that go as how the board saw. Uh, but otherwise, no, my, my company is fully aware that I, um, I said I was doing this. Um, I am, I do know the people that they're considering to be consultants, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, uh, the hired on consultants. I do have a working relationship with them. I don't think that's a conflict just because I know them, but mm -hmm. No, the company doesn't have a problem with me doing this, and anything that directly required, I would just have to step aside. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, I would assume that Waitsfield Telecom, essentially they receive most of their uh, bandwidth from fiber optic today, correct? Uh, yes, um, well, yeah, any provider is connected to the greater world with fiber optics at this point. Our company has for many years been deploying the fiber to our actual subscribers um, way ahead of this we, um, with the kind of windfall that's occurred with the CUDs. But we also do benefit from the, the new CUD models where we're operating three of these, uh, the NEK one, uh, Maple Broadband, and uh, CP Fiber. Uh, so we're doing for them what we've already been doing for ourselves. Plus, we're working with multiple towns like Bolton, Charlotte, uh, that in lieu of them joining CUDs, they just went directly to us and asked us with grant money to, you know, just deploy fiber, you know, to just bypass the process. Uh, so, yep, we're, we're doing it. We are. Uh, and I, just, I think in today's day and age, it's impossible not to have some type of communications without using fiber. Yeah, the whole the, the greater network does not run on anything but <laughs> it's the way of things. Any other questions? It's nice to have somebody with the background that's interested in uh, doing this. So thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we're lucky. So, um, Michael is the only applicant. <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> I'm wondering if we could uh, move, uh, if someone could move for his appointment. And also, I do see that there's a proposed uh, motion to appoint Eric Wells and Aaron Dickinson. Um, uh, if the board is comfortable doing that without interviewing Eric and Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, uh, I've served as your representative at CUD since its yeah. inception and been chairing the, the body the last six months. So I will, uh, after speaking with Michael on Friday, uh, uh, the town's in good shoes with having uh, as your as your representative. Should you choose your it's probably more appropriate <coughs> to make the the motion to appoint uh, uh, Mr. Vance, and then have the motion to appoint yeah. the uh, uh, alternates after we have done that. So I'd move to appoint Michael Vance as Williston's representative to the Chittenden Communications Union District for an unexpired term through April 30th, 2024. Is there a second? I'll second. 
All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Michael, thank you very much. Congratulations. Oh, thank thank you. Yeah, such as it is. That's thank you for, the right for taking one to the, for the team. Yeah, I'll, I'll connect with you tomorrow and get you all all set to go. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Um, so then I'll move to appoint Eric Wells and Aaron Dickinson as alternates to the Chittenden Communications Union District for an unexpired term through April 30th, 2024. Is there a second? Second. Second. Aye. All those in Me favor too. say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, next, a uh, temporary event permit for Green Mountain Cy Cyclocross. Yep. Careful how to say that. Eric. Yep. Um, brief overview for this for the board. This is an event at Catamount Community Forest planned for September the 30th of this year. It'll be the third year that this event is run. It's um, it's a, it's a bicycle <coughs> race uh, there. Um, the last couple of years, it's gone well. The staff hasn't heard any, any issues with the event. Um, they're anticipating about 300 folks to be there. Um, I'm just going through their application here. Um, it's similar to how they ran it last year. Um, with, with these, they undergo a staff review, um, public safety, public works, planning and zoning and manager's <coughs> office. So we've, been, we've shared, um, Permit conditions for consideration for this with, with the board as prior materials as, as we as we do when we review these applications. Um, staff um, with the um, items listed for the conditions, staff doesn't have any uh, further um, uh, hesitation in recommending uh, approval of this for the board. They have mentioned that they are looking to have alcohol on site as they have in previous years. We haven't received their catering permit yet. Um, I bring that forward to the board at a, at a future date once received. Um, for, consider should you wish to uh, um, grant this permit um, if the board has additional questions for the organizer um, we can certainly invite them in at a, at a future meeting but I, similar to the last couple of years how they've run in we haven't run into any any issues with how they've uh, managed their event in the past questions Jeff had I, I believe a ton of questions for them last year if <laughs> I recall <laughs> and they you know he obviously knows much more than we all did about this particular type of event so I was satisfied and he was satisfied last year and if there was no problems I think it makes sense yeah I would assume maybe parking is one of their biggest struggles with 300 people right yeah we we've looked um and as part of the catamount license agreement with with events there um, we'll have to the board uh, later this summer working through some of those parking questions and with the changes to the parking ordinance on governor chitman road we restrict parking on the south side of the road now as well um so they they've got an understanding with their parking capacity there and, and limitations on the road um, so certainly something we identified in public safety as well because we don't want to have any any challenges right. getting getting to the site and they did call it out so clearly they're aware of it So if there are no other questions, uh, we'll be looking for a motion. Move to approve a temporary event permit for a Green Mountain Cyclocross race to be held at the Catamount Community Forest on September 30th, 2023. Is there a second? Second. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Hey, you get to vote that time, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next event, next uh, item. Uh, water sewer connection fees report. So we have um, Bruce, you're going to be presenting, and, and Wayne? Uh, Wayne? Okay. Excellent. Come on up. Okay. <laughs> All right. And briefly, if I could, Ted, I can run yeah. a brief, brief over to the board. So, um, Wayne Elliott, um, engineer we work with from the firm Aldrich and Elliott, he's prepared an updated water and sewer connection fee analysis. Uh, for your discussion and consideration this evening. Um, this report was last updated in 2007. Both our water and sewer um, connection fees are paid for all new connections in town. Um, we're gonna, uh, staff seats direction based on the report, you'll receive an overview of this evening uh, where the board wishes to set the connection <coughs> fees for fiscal year 2024. That'll be uh, considered at your next meeting in June. Uh, the fees as identified in the report, they've been built into the draft water and sewer budgets here under consideration this evening. I have a possible option to accept the report at a, at a future meeting as well. And also of note, the towns reduce the connection fees for affordable housing by 50% as part of the fee schedule decision um, um, in the past, um, in each year. So that'll be part of, of your decision moving forward to continue that, that reduction with, with the fees as they are. So um, 
we've included the draft report in your materials, and I have a memo that kind of walks through the citations within our ordinance um, that, that works how we base these fees and our administrative procedures here. So I think um, I'll probably pause there and, and on just kind of the procedural items, and I'll turn to Wayne and Bruce just what the, what the report says here and what you have to consider this evening. <laughs> in that, uh, there was a, a, a report done by Mike Munson back in 2007 and um, should have been reviewed or updated. And we did look at it in like 2017 quickly with Rick. And I'm not trying to pass the buck, but we didn't really move on it at that point. Uh, <clears throat> so we've asked Aldrich and Elliot. Wayne Elliott, to uh, take a look at that. We have to let the professionals in. <laughs> <laughs> See, I told you you were going to get yeah. slap this in. I'm just going to move it over there for you. <laughs> so anyway, Wayne's here to uh, let us know, you know the updates and what he's done for us. Don't move that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you have to move it because you're going to roll, roll back over. <laughs> Well, it's good to be back here. It's been a while since I've been in the board, in front of the board. Um, I think I actually go back to 1988 in the town of Walston. So <laughs> I've got a lot of institutional knowledge here over the years. Um, so as Bruce said, you know, really the task here was to update the 2007 document that Mike Munson prepared. You know, one thing we tried to do is not reinvent the wheel. The town's been using that process procedure for many, many years, so it didn't make any sense to really change it. Uh, we did change the name of it. It was called a hookup fee analysis. We changed it to connection fee. One of the things you need to be a little bit careful about is I do quite a few of these, <coughs> especially in Chittenden County, and there's a lot of different terminology that's used, and it's interchangeable. So, for example, you know, Williston on the sewer, you have an allocation fee, which is really the price or the cost to purchase the treatment capacity, and you have a sewer connection fee, and you have a water connection fee. You know, South Burlington, for example, has a water allocation fee, which is really similar to your connection fee. And then they have a connection fee, but the connection fee is, is kind of very nominal. So the only reason I kind of point that out, if you're trying to compare, you obviously want to be com competitive with adjacent similar communities. But when you're looking at that, you just got to make sure you're comparing apples and apples. and almost have to look at a standard typical residential unit to see what they would pay with all the fees to see if you're kind of in, in the ballpark and range and also making sure the flows are similar to that definition of that kind of typical residential unit. Okay. I'm just going to briefly go through a little bit with you about the uh, process again we really tried to um, stay consistent we did change a couple other things in this so I guess I'll just mention um, when Mike did this back in 2007, um, when he projected the future flows, he did it on the build-out analysis. We backed that off to 10 years, so really what we're looking at, um, we're recommending this be updated every five years, um, but we looked out 10 years really for the projected increase in water demand and sewer flows. A couple of reasons for that is if you start going out too far, um, we're kind of at a different time right now. We're projecting out construction costs out three or four or five, 10 years. Very difficult to go out much farther than that right now at any kind of degree of certainty. Um, the other thing is we don't know what's gonna happen necessarily with kind of those demands or those kind of growth projections if you're going out too far. So we thought it would be a little bit better to keep that in a little bit tighter and really just go out to five, go out to five and then 10 years talk a little bit about the methodology for the sewer connection fees kind of a four-step process we define the sewer service area one thing in Williston that's been very very well defined and uh, that hasn't changed since 2007 for the purposes of what we've done here we really assume those service areas for both the um, sewer and the water are very very similar uh, Current sewer flows uh, for 2022, about 682,000 gallons per day. Uh, projected sewer flows, we did a bunch of work, as Bruce mentioned, back in 2017. We kind of built off that and updated that. Uh, we're projecting over the next 10-year period an increase of about 100,580 gallons per day. So that puts you up to 
a little bit over 782,000 gallons per day. Then the next step, um, with the help of the town staff, is what we did is we updated the value of the town built sewer infrastructure. Um, so we had the uh, sewer fund reconciliation, and that's important because we're really just factoring in the infrastructure that the town has paid for, um, not the developer paid infrastructure. So that is not included in this in this calculation. For the uh, depreciated value of the uh, town built sewer infrastructure, it came up with about um, $8.2 million. Then what we did is we um, projected out those projects that we think are gonna be needed to be implemented by the town over the next 10 years. And the other thing we're doing that is trying to project when they're required. So for example, if it's three years, we're coming up with the estimated construction costs, we're including a contingency engineering other fees and we're projecting it out to that um, anticipated start date. So we came up with about $2.4 million in projected sewer improvements that are needed. Uh, those are the, uh, the good news is the sewer collection system is in good shape. These are primarily at the existing pump stations and forest mains. So the first one is the North Willison Road pump station upgrade. That's actually underway right now. Um, the one after that is the uh, River Cove upgrade, which includes um, <coughs> adding a third <coughs> pump. Uh, South Ridge is really age-related. That's projected for 2025. And the last one is the Industrial Lab, and that actually includes an um, upgrade of the size of the force main to get the flow from the pump station up to the gravity system. Um, so again, those total costs, we estimated a little bit over $2.4 million. Uh, all we did is we took the um, total value of the town built infrastructure and the value of the new infrastructure that needs to be upgraded, um, divided that by the projected sewer flows in 2033 of 782,118 gallons per day. And that's how we came up with this maximum fee charge per gallon of $13.70. So, um, Keep in mind from the board's position, that's really what we're suggesting is the maximum. The board would have the discretion to lower that if you choose to. Um, but again, that we feel kind of with the methodology and consistency with the 2007 document, we feel that's really the maximum that we charge for the situation. And also keep in mind on the sewer side, you know, you charge $15 a gallon per day for the uh, sewer allocation, which is the treatment capacity you know, that's being purchased over at the uh, Tri-Town uh, Treatment Facility. These are both one-time fees. So I can go through the water very quickly. Uh, can same. I have, can I just, uh, I have a question. Yes, absolutely, <laughs> jump in. Yep. So I understand the methodology. I'm a little confused on what, um, I was in my own head to kind of clarify what this fee is trying to do. Yep. Because it's kind of, it seems like you're hooking on, you are, getting a piece of our depreciated value of what you're hooking into. Yep, so that's, that's a one time. Yeah. And they haven't paid for that, so that's part of their buy-in of that at one time. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. And then there's also a, a piece of future, yep. which they will pay for again. A portion of it, yep. yep. Um, okay, do we, um, this might be a question for Shirley, do we have a separate fund to collect the money that's for future projects, or is it just going to the sewer? Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I answer this right, Shirley, but we, uh, we'll, we have a capital fund where as we go through the budget, some of these projects we're allocating transfers from the enterprise fund into that capital savings account for, for the future need. Okay, so if, so, let's, um, so some portion of this $13 is going for future projects, say 25, well, 20% 20 of it based on these numbers. So 25% of this $13 is going technically, according to methodology, is using the future projects. So but we're not right off the bat taking that and putting it in a separate holding fund for a capital project. We do that on an annual basis. Yeah, on an annual basis, right, Charlie? Yeah. Yeah. And that's usually dictated by your sewer ordinance, you know, as far as how you can, you know, how you can use those fees and where they go and what you can spend them on. That's good. Um, is, that a, is that a $13 increase or that's a, thir that's a $13? Dollar? $13, that's $13. right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so your currently charge is, uh, Let's see, uh, for sewers 846, so you would be increasing it to that per gallon per day. Yep. Okay. 
Yeah, what you're really trying to do with these projects is, you know, there's a responsibility with the new development that's coming in for them to kind of bear a portion of the cost for these expansion and upgrades that are needed for additional capacity. And what you really don't want to do is put the burden of that cost back on the existing sewer customers. So I think that's where I was kind of going when I started reading this. I was assuming it would all be for future, but it's not. It's also... Well, it generally is, that. but it depends how quickly you're going to kind of catch up on that making projections you know you're assuming that you're going to get a certain number of new development growth each year um, it, it may come in at a little bit different rate so we, we try to predict that as close as we can over the next five and then ten years but it depends a little bit how that how that comes in it doesn't be lumpy right if you yeah, have to right. do a really major infrastructure you it might get all good put on yep. a four four 20 to 20 house unit because that's the one that pushes us, us over so you don't want to get that lumpy there so. Yeah, and the other thing is it could come in a little bit slower too. So what that would do in theory is if there was something we predicted needed to be done in four years, then maybe what it would do is say that doesn't need to be done now for six years if the growth doesn't happen quite as quickly as anticipated and you're not collecting those allocation fee or connection fees quite as quickly. And if the housing, if we end up doing more housing than anticipated given the push rate that we're that would just lower that direction that if we actually built more housing. Oh no, because when we check them, this this is the number regardless of what we do for 10 years. Yeah. yeah, and if it happened quicker, it could actually accelerate some of those improvements that could be needed too, so it can kind of go either way. Okay. That's why it's kind of good to go through this a little bit more frequently, you know, and just it's a good check-in to see, see where things are at. Yeah, somewhere there was a recommendation to do every five years, right? I can't yep. remember what it was. Mm. Okay, I'm, I'm, up, I'm up to speed on <laughs> sewer connection fees. Yep. So I'll kind of <laughs> brushly go over the water. Exact same process. We're using the same kind of methodology here. Um, same growth projections, kind of assuming the sewer and the water are very, very similar. Again, we kind of assume that the service areas are very, very similar. Um, on page nine, so the town built um, the appreciated value of the water is about $7.4 million. And we identified three projects that are really going to be needed for from a capacity expansion standpoint. Uh, the Route 2 one was actually completed. That one is the um, project, the water line replacement that's being done about the uh, still ongoing um, roadway improvements on Route 2 and Industrial Ave. Um, the next one is Chamberlain Lane. There's about 600 feet of 8 inch in there that's been identified for upgrade to 12 inch. And then there's a section on Governor Chittenden Road that was identified quite a few years ago. So those projects come up to about 775000 So the combined total of those with the uh, town built appreciated value, again, we're just dividing that by the um, projected water demand of um, the 818580 And that's where we come up with the, um, the unit cost of the 997 So. On the water side, you're going to be increasing from uh, about seven dollars and forty-four per gallon per day, uh, up to the maximum of nine ninety-seven gallons per day. And I, under I underlined ceiling, ceiling price somewhere. Does that mean that that it should be no less than what we're, um, the recommendation, the report recommends no less than this, or the, what the report the, is recommending this is? A maximum. Right, yep. so we could choose something less if we wanted to, is that what, like one time every 10 years? <laughs> yeah, well, um, annually the board sets the fee schedule and I'll be at your next meeting. So this is to inform that conversation and we've also used that, um, that maximum fee in building the budgets this evening as well. So mm -hmm. having this first on the agenda to see if there's consensus from the board and proceeding with these amounts. Um, so the board has discretion how it would like to set the fees, but through the engineering methodology um, and, and how this is costed out, it, it um, illustrates that these fees could yield the um, assisting with the future capital needs for both um, uh, utilities in, in that manner. But it's always the board's discretion where you want to set the fees. Okay. I mean, I don't know why I think all this hard work and reporting done, I wouldn't say like, I I think thirteen dollars and twenty-five cents is a better number. I mean, I, I just there must be some other reason why you would choose a different number. But this is the ceiling number. Just keep in mind on the water connection fee. For example, you know if you're charging the nine eighty-seven, so 
you know, that equates to a three bedroom home, you know, about $2,293. And then you've got the cost for the meter on top of that at 375. So you're looking at about $2,668. Um, that's the maximum. Thank you. Are there other questions? <coughs> There's, uh, we're not looking for a decision tonight, but the uh, staff is looking for uh, consensus or guidance as to the, um, the fee. So, I mean, I, I totally understand how the calculations put together make sense to me. Um, what about the 50% for the uh, affordable housing units? Is that something we're talking about right now, or is that something that comes about? Um, no, just to put it on your on your radar, but that would be included um, in the um, fee schedule for your next meeting. Um, and granted that this fee um, is increasing, the 50% of this fee would thus increase proportionally as well, but in keeping that same methodology for a 50% reduction for affordable housing. So that would be part of the fee schedule. Um, that you'd see next, next meeting. So do we stick with that 50% or is that something that's kind of negotiable given the whatever the housing is that's being put in place? I, mean, I, I, I believe it lives in the zoning, it may live in the zoning ordinance, but ultimately you're, you know, that, that could always be amended um, um, by the board's action as well, looking how to, how to assess those fees through, through zoning and then ultimately what the, what the fee is, is more mechanically at this point, if mm -hmm. it's, your policy says 50%, you want to keep with that, or if it's a higher number, then whatever the, uh, the fee you have set would be whatever that it is based on that reduction that's, that the town sets in policy. So if I had an interest in convincing my fellow board members to, to not change the rate from what it is today for affordable housing units, I would have that opportunity tonight or at a different time? Probably the next meeting with setting the fee schedule, and I just want to double check on just how the bylaw plays into that and just so see what, yeah, what that interplay is. Rather than a fee change, it might be a zoning thing where you change by the bylaws. <coughs> so you're, you're saying like that, just to clarify, like you're <coughs> possibly consider, considering like it's 50% of the rate right now, but since the rate's going up so much, maybe they get a 75% cut in the rate or something to even right. it out to where it is currently? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will, I, I will. I will have uh, a discussion before it turns out to be too late because I didn't bring it up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll uh, consult with the planning director tomorrow and I can have an answer for the, for the board on that. And um, I, as I recall, the, the fee could likely be amended during the year for something like that as well if you change your the zoning that was attached to it as well. Okay. I haven't got up to speed on zoning. You haven't given me anything there to <laughs> spend my weekend on. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> I to figure out how I would adjust that fee through zoning. But thanks for putting it on the table. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're all set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stormwater Fund Budget, Fiscal Year 2024. Christine is here. Good evening. Bruce, I see you're not moving. Uh, Eric, Eric, can you, yeah. Eric, can you give an introduction and then we'll go to yep. the presentation. So uh, the board's going to hear next the town's three uh, utilities or enterprise fund budgets being proposed for stormwater, uh, sewer, and water this evening. Uh, a couple of years ago, we, we shifted the practice um, to review these budgets in the springtime to kind of break up the uh, budget review for the board. Um, in the last couple of years, we can, we can certainly re review the timing of this in the future as well. But the select board serves uh, another job you have, are commissioners of these three funds. So you set the uh, budgets and you set the rates every year before the turn of the fiscal year. Um, these aren't um, voted on by, by uh, the folks in town. Um, that was changed a number of years ago by, by the town. So you'll hear this evening um, the proposals from staff on the operating and capital for, for these budgets, um, along with the rates proposed. And as I mentioned, the rate schedule will come to you next week. Um, so as you review these budgets, um, it's recommended by staff that you also 
um, have a consensus on what the rate is attached to that budget because if you approve the budget amount, um, it's going to have a rate tied to it that then you would formally need to adopt the rate at your next meeting. So um, I think as we have discussion tonight, it's important to understand from staff's perspective where the board wants um, the rates to fall w within these budgets. And I put a policy memo together, especially on the water and sewer budget, there's some room for discussion on, on the rate structure with some potential um, other revenue streams to explore or deferment of a, of a project as well. So we have um, our staff, our director and assistant director from Public Works to walk through these for the board this evening. Um, Finance Director Shirley's here as well and myself to answer questions. Um, so I hope the board wants to take it. We, we've got an order for each one and then um, suggested motions. And we, we did catch just uh, about a $7,000 addition in water and sewer just at the beginning of the week. So I adjusted the draft motions should the board consider the bottom lines as drafted just to reflect that change. That's kind of where we are right now to begin this budget journey tonight. So I'll uh, I'll turn over to my my colleagues in Public Works. So um, I think everybody here knows that uh, Christine is now our assistant Public Works director, but her previous role was stormwater coordinator. So uh, she's still going to uh, walk us through the stormwater budget. Um, I'm not throwing. Well, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, be here with you tonight. Um, the, with the stormwater budget, uh, we're happy to say we're not proposing any um, changes to the utility rate. We believe that we can keep it where it is currently. Um, there have been some um, some changes, though, that I just kind of want to highlight. Uh, in you know, as far as the we are seeing some changes, some decreases in the overall number of utility of user receipts. Um, that kind of has been trending downwards, not because our population is going downwards or the housing is you know, going away, but because we are seeing um, some changes in, in the way the, billings, the billing works. Um, so when we have a larger developments coming in, those are billed at a commercial rate, which is slightly higher than our residential rates are. But as those um, developments do transfer over to residential occupancies, um, those rates then <coughs> get reflected accordingly. So we did have a couple of, um, you know, fairly large developments that have been getting built out over the last couple of years. And so you will see that there's been a, a downward trend over the last couple of years with that. But we think that the, um, even still with the current utility fee that and the trend that we're seeing that it's sustainable, uh, we don't believe that it's going to continue. It's going to be um, significant, um, continue to be at this rate. Um, we do think that it's going to stabilize um, and likely come up again in the near future. Um, so we'll see that uh, in the numbers there. Uh, I believe the largest, um, you know, some of the more significant changes that we did see in our um, budget is going to be in the administration side of, of the program. Um, those are just from cost of living adjustments, uh, material costs, labor costs, um, which are being felt across, um, I think, all industries at this time. Um, the other... Um, you know, the other larger um, purchase, I don't want to say purchase, but the other um, budget item that we have in here um, that you'll see is under the capital improvements, which includes some um, money for some what's called cure in place pipes um, that are being proposed for a section on Boya Circle. We um, were able to get new piping placed in, well, not new, but cure in place pipe um, installed in the majority of that community. Those pipes are very deep, so putting something in. Um, using a cure and place pipe, which doesn't require excavation. I have to ask you a question, the engineer and me. Is that like an insert into the pipes? Is that what they do? It's, it is very much so like that. It's, yeah. um, it's a fabric material with an epoxy that's built into it. Uh -huh. And then um, it's the epoxy is actually activated and cured using the steam. Oh, cool. Yeah. So you don't have to dig it all up. Exactly. Yes. So we do, have, um, we do have one more section of a Boyo Circle that we'd like to um, you know, install the CIP <coughs> for. And then um, also on Harvest on Harvest Lane. So, um, but those are I believe the um, some of the more highlighted points. And I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions. I was quite disappointed that the stormwater stormwater vehicle was just a car to get around in. It's because it's really cool. <laughs> you know, really high clearance or something. But. 
hands or an LG. Something yeah, like that, you know? Yeah. I mean, if you want to give me a storm tracking vehicle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not enough money for that. Um, I know this is, this is a complicated question. I don't mean this to go on and on, but I've just, I was under curious under stormwater maintenance, repair and replacement of stormwater basins, piping and outfalls. Like, can you give me kind of a three sentence outline of which ones we're responsible for, the town is responsible for versus? So any of the infrastructure that's gonna be within the town's right of way is essentially gonna be um, town's responsibility for maintenance, um, catch basins, pipes, outfalls, um, all part of our. In the, in the right of way, okay. Yeah. Yeah, you did it in one sentence, thank you. I like what you did on the mud pond entrance off Oak Hill Road, it looks a lot better. That's great, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so for the stormwater vehicle, um, <laughs> it's being replaced this year, is that right? No. Oh, okay, so it's a 2030 replacement, so I thought seven years would be this year, no. No, no, it was just acquired. It was just acquired, okay. All right, well then I won't inquire about whether or not it's electric because it either is or it isn't. <laughs> well, well, we, we did make an effort to try to get an electric vehicle. Yeah. Unfortunately, they weren't available. Yeah. Uh, and I don't believe that there's... Not a great year to buy vehicles, so, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, we, we, uh, we came to the board once with that already. That, that we did try very yeah. hard to get electric. Yeah. Uh, there's a state, they are on state contract. Oh, right, I remember, yeah, yeah. But wasn't any fall wheel drive on the state contract, but there were electric vehicles there, but they were like the lead for things like that, very yeah. small. Mm -hmm. uh, so what we did was we went to the next best thing, which was the hybrid. Okay. We're keeping, we're really trying to stay on top of the electric vehicle and okay. what's going on. We'll talk about that a little bit more when we go through water and sewer as well. Okay. I appreciate hybrid. That's <laughs> Any other questions? Um, we will be looking for a motion. A move to approve the stormwater fund operating budget for fiscal year 2024 in the amount of $716,485 and capital program for fiscal years 2024 through 2029 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Before the vote, I am, I'm going to abstain because my neighborhood in terms of stormwater is a mess. Uh, so I don't want there to be any potential conflict of interest. So all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed, nay. All those abstaining, aye. The ayes have it. It is approved. Okay, so great. Thank you. Sewer fund. Christine, are you staying for that? He said he wasn't going to throw you under the bus, but are you? I guess I'm doing a volunteer. He's going right. to throw under the bus next okay. year, so. <laughs> no, well, well, he's the volunteer. He's throwing under the bus. Right. Okay. So sewer fund budget. Sewer, okay. <clears throat> so uh, you have my uh, transmittal <clears throat> that talks about Quite honestly, the biggest thing uh, this year is the uh, increase that we're seeing to uh, the treatment rate, uh, which is 16.9%. That's what's driving a lot of our increase. It's the largest increase we've ever seen from the uh, <coughs> treatment plant, the Tri-Town that we're part of. So uh, just going through the budget itself then. Basic user charge is only grown by the uh, CPI, it's like we do every year. <coughs> user receipts, you can see there uh, what we're suggesting uh, for, as the proposed rate, and that's uh, straight from the uh, connection fees that Wayne just did that upgrade on for us. <coughs> we're pleased to have a 12.9% uh, increase, which is the fairly large increase, but not the largest we've ever had. In 2013, I was going to pull those numbers today and forgot to, but they were larger than that. Um, I can certainly get that for you. 
One of the things that I've done differently in this to try to keep those fees down and something that we don't normally include <coughs> in a budget is on the hook on fees. <coughs> we don't normally take a big project and put that number into the, into the budget because we never know for sure when these projects are happening or not happening. So it would truly be just a guess and it does obviously affect our rates. <coughs> in this case, because of the new zoning and um, I'm still wrapping my head around what it's called. Form-based code. What is it? Form-based code. Form-based code, there you go. Um, <coughs> the Finney Hotel is pretty much a 99.99% guarantee that it's going to happen in probably around September they'll start working on it. Which means they will pay us their fees within that budget year and we know that. So uh, in an attempt to help keep the rate down, I did put in uh, their fee that they're gonna pay on the 11,085 gallons per day. And that's why you see under hook on fee such a large increase to the 239, 210. <clears throat> and just as examples, if you look back at 2020 actual and 2021 actual, the reason those numbers and the actuals were higher there is because Another hotel came in at that time, another big project came in at that time. But if you were to go back and look at the actual budget, we did not include those numbers in the budget. This time, like I said, uh, in, in an attempt to help keep this rate down, um, even though it may not seem like it's at the 12 point some odd percent, that was the idea here. Um, We're making good money. The interest earns thirty thousand. That's pretty good. <laughs> <I'm sure. laughs> so um, there's other. There's not any other real large increases uh, in this budget to uh, point out. So unless you know, I'm, I'm certainly willing to take questions. And, and I could I could add as we look at this and I. Um, in the memo I provided the board for policy items on this is looking at the uh, uh, the net position, otherwise known as fund balance, the net position of, uh, with an enterprise fund. Um, due to the net position of this fund, which is currently at the end of FY22 audited financials, just over $4.6 million, as we look to potentially keep the rate a little bit lower, um, we propose using about a little over $180,000 of the net position to assist in smoothing the rate a little bit. Um, we do this carefully and cautiously, um, knowing where the net position is now, but if we didn't transfer these, um, this revenue model, we, we were looking at a rate increase of more of the 25% mark. Um, with the proposed rate increase, um, we ran some math on what that looks like for um, an average household. The average number is 180 gallons per day, um, and given it's going to depend on the household, how, how long people are taking showers, things of that nature, water use. It's, it's hard to quantify, but that's a number used in the county, 180 gallons per day. So uh, with our current sewer use rate, and you use the water use because that the water's got to go somewhere in the sewer area to, to measure that. So our, our current rate is 775 per thousand gallons of use. For this average user, that's about $43 per month. Um, this proposed rate increase at 875 per thousand gallons. That's about um, $48 per month, so an increase about $5 per month based on these estimates as a, another way to think about it on a dollar standpoint versus a percentage standpoint. But this proposal does utilize net position and that amount to help keep the rate increase a little bit lower. Um, it's at the board's discretion. If the board would like to use more net position to then offset the rate further, um, we could look at that um, as well. But we, we felt we started at this number we felt was a good, um, a good starting point, but for the board's discussion as part of the budget, if you want, where you want to end up with your rate next year. I would just like to add to that a little bit that I would be careful in using too much of that fund balance, uh, only because we're already using the Finney Hotel number in there that's not going to be in there again next year either. So the more of that we keep pulling down, sooner or later it's going to come back to we're going to end up having a larger increase down the road somewhere. Yeah, but at two hundred thousand dollars a year, I think you get 
at a $4.6 million. I will be well off the board before that becomes a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, actually, uh, honestly, so, so what is the, four, what is the, um, this balance earmarked for? Yep, it's, it's essentially um, in the enterprise fund, it's, it's unallocated, okay. so it's, it's unassigned. Right. So we, we think about things in these enterprise funds with what could go, what could go wrong a right. lot too. If we had a major pump station failure, um, for example, you know, that would be very, very expensive to, to cure. Um, it's also there to use discretionary for capital projects and for strategic rate smoothing. But um, I think I, to the board last year, for new members, um, we looked at the, the town currently doesn't have a net position policy for these enterprise funds. With our general fund, we have a 10 to 20 percent um, kind of window for the unassigned fund balance. Um, we've talked about um, exploring that further. It's just it's um, we need to see what other towns might have in place, but. You know, seeing that number to understand is that a good number? You know, what's your ceiling you want to keep? And there's a lot of variables at play with right, this. Four point six is more than the entire town's unrestricted fund balance. Right. <laughs> so it's it's certainly a it's on a, a larger a high side, yeah. but understanding when if there was a potential issue here, especially on the sewer side, the the cost would would be quite expensive as well. So one of those costs could end up being whatever the uh, right now. The treatment plant does biosolids, and then they do land application of those biosolids. <clears throat> That's becoming less and less attractive and harder and harder to get rid of. <clears throat> if they were sending some to Canada, Canada has stopped taking them. Uh, where are they sending them now? I forget the, the next. There's no place in Vermont for these biosolids to go. The, PFA, the PFAS and PFOs uh, are really playing really being hectic on the, the whole biosolids industry because they those forever chemicals are staying in that stuff <clears throat> so we're getting more and more away from land application so what does that mean that means we've got to find another way to get rid of them or have the treatment plants modernized to a point that they can treat this stuff and pull it out of everything <clears throat> if that happens we're going to look at some huge huge increases in cost and expansions or whatever we have to do to modernize that plant that we are part owner of. So $4 million dollars sounds like a lot of money, I get it, but $4 million dollars can go away really quick in this industry. Is that technology even on the horizon? I don't know if it's there or not, Tim. But that's where we're getting to. Just because it isn't there doesn't mean the EPA won't come out and say, you've got to do this, you've got to figure something out. Whether that means incineration or whatever else. So if it's not, going to, it's not going to Canada anymore, where's it going? It's, there are a couple places in the U.S. that are still taking it, but nowhere in Vermont. We, there, we have been lucky in Essex in that the, the product that comes out of there, for the most part, everything is low enough that we're still able to do some land application. <clears throat> but it's getting less and less and less. Please identify a biosolid. What's that? Please identify a biosolid. What do you mean? Biosolid is just it's just a byproduct from the end of, at the end of the treatment of, of, of the sewage. Stuff that does not go in the river, right? <laughs> it's, it's the it's the cake for lack of a better term. And the Whitcomb Farm uh, is one of our big places that will take biosolids and, and apply it to their field. <clears throat> but those fields are being tested all the time for PFAs and PFOs and all that good stuff to make sure that nothing is getting into there. <laughs> and it's been a couple of years, but I'd like to set up an opportunity for the board to have a tour of the wastewater treatment plant over in mm -hmm. this exjunction that we are owners of. So you, you can see, kind of see everything in action there too. <laughs> I think they used to, is that something they used to spread along the, uh, the interstate here in Richmond over by the monitor barn? No, that wasn't necessarily biosolids. That was, uh, P and P. It was like whether it was P and P, but P and P's lost their fields. They can't do that anymore, and that's because of the, the byproducts that are leaching out. Those fields are closed, and that's what's happening. They're closing more and more of those fields for those kinds of applications. I have to add that um, in Wayne's presentation, he had two point four million in upgrades, and we have currently in the pump station upgrade. Building annually for what we need, let alone what's 
The last, the last pump station, if you all remember, <coughs> in the North Williston Road one was, uh, we went out to bid on that three times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the third time, it came back in as high as the first time. And we didn't have enough money, so we came here and asked to be allowed to use some of that fund balance so that we could do that pump station. That's another way that we use that fund balance. And I think that's actually surely why I, I, I bumped on this, is that I, I, when I was flipping through it, I, ex, I kind of expected the big projects to be paid for out of the $4.6 million, but they're not. They're paid for out of the operating budget, which may or may not be have a negative or positive end result. But we're not using, we're not, if you were to tell me that the 4.6 is being held because we have a $2 million project we need to do in five years and we're holding it, then I'd be really comfortable with that. But it's not, it's, um, we're raising the rates in order to fund projects while we're protecting the fund balance. So, um, and just one reason that I kind of, uh, this is, well, first of all, you guys know I do my numbers, this is what I do for a living, but um, between the water and the sewer increases, it's over $100 for a house. And it's $4 a month on one of them and $60 a year on another one. Um, that's almost as much as the whole town budget, municipal budget, was costing us, like a $400,000 house. So it's a way to think about it. This is not, it's not getting voted on, so it's not getting quite the, the look, but it's kind of doubling the impact of the municipal budget. So I just want to be careful that we're not, that we're doing this thoughtfully. Um, I do also know that if you don't increase it for the rate increases this year, you're gonna face it again next year, right? It's just, it doesn't go away unless the rates drop, which would be a surprise. So I know I, I wouldn't, I think I'm pretty comfortable on sewer where it is um, because the rate increase is lower than, the rate increase to homeowners is actually lower than the rate increase we're proposing for, for people, <laughs> for houses, right? It's 16.3%, the wholesale, treatment costs going up and the rate increase is 12.9. So it's lower, so I kind of feel like that's something we have to step up to eventually and that I could get behind that one. Different story on water, but <laughs> I know we're having that discussion. Other questions or comments? <clears throat> uh, just a real quick one, this is also a Shirley question. This 8%, it looks like we're shifting 8% of a lot of the cost of the town not just Eric's salary. What do you call it? The, the budget of the of operating the town is going, it's like 25% uh, of it's going to, to these three utilities. Is that a, is that a? Um, is it, yes. <laughs> is, that, is, is there any methodology that came up with that? Is it an audible number? Is it, yeah, I, I would be interested in, I'm, I wouldn't be able to, I, it's not a short term project, but I'd be interested to, before we do this again, to. Yeah, it's been on my to-do list since I got here. Been historically, that's what we use, but I have found nothing that documents how we came up with that. Okay. So I think some time studies or something would be good to come up with something. a real number. Yeah. And I might not be able to find it very quickly, but um, one or the other of these two budgets, so it's either sewer or the water, had all these you know percentages across multiple line items and then a, a line that was just sharing of the cost of the town, which I just wanted to make sure was not a double count. Um, but it, it's, a, it's probably smaller than the $7,000, so <laughs> don't have to try, chase it down now. But, because um, this is shifting, it's kind of shifting cost of town governance to uh, utility users, and people don't really have a choice. They need water in their house, so. Uh, which I'm okay if it's fair. So just to make sure that. Well, it's not shifting non utility costs to the people, though, right? It's not shifting like highway department costs or fire department costs to the utility budget. No, just the, all the overhead. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, if, given what I've experienced the last couple of months. 25% may be low, but we should, we should just have a, be sure that's right if we're going to do that. Sure. Any other questions or comments? 
If not, we'll be looking for a motion. Well, I would move to approve the sewer fund operating budget for fiscal year 2024 in the amount of $2,416,205 in capital program for fiscal years 2024 through 2029 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Yes. You can have that one. <laughs> Chair recognizes Mr. Eichmann. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay, the ayes have it. Sorry, sorry, Terry. Um, what, was that the yeah. include the seven thousand dollars that it I did? Yeah, it yeah, did. Okay. Just double checking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Water fund budget. <clears throat> okay, water fund budget. I mean, we're looking at the same kind of things as we just did. Uh, the increase from the Champlain Water District uh, to the wholesale rate is nine point five percent. Uh, they're looking at the same kind of things that we're looking at as far as uh, the cost of doing business. Um, we still have the capital sheets, and I should have had this on the sewer. Oh, I did. <coughs> My bottom bullet on both of these is uh, the use of ARPA funds to be <coughs> for capital improvement projects. And I'm just going to put a plug in for ARPA funds, and I know you're all smart and know this, but you got to make a decision on what's going to happen with ARPA money. It's going to go toward public works projects. You've got to get it because it's going to be permitting and other things. If, if we really think we're going to use any of that money for any of our projects, we've got to start working on it to make the deadlines that they're imposing on us. So that's, that's all set. <laughs> um, so the water budget isn't a whole lot different. Uh, the same kind of thing with the hook-on fees uh, for the Finney Hotel in this one. Um, <clears throat> the one thing I will like to I'd like to point or talk to just real quickly, and, and Terry asked me downstairs about the uh, industrial lab water break <coughs> that happened uh, last Wednesday. It was supposed to be a short week. Well, <laughs> <laughs> real quick. Anyway, about 5:20 in the morning, a water line <coughs> break was discovered on industrial lab by a worker on his way to work at ECI who happened to be the same guy that stood out there then for 18 hours fixing it. Um, but he called our water department. The process got going. What we found was an eight inch duct wire duct iron line that went off our main line um, went to serve the six condos on Foxwood Circle. Developed four or five holes in it. From deter deterioration over time of rocks sitting on the pipe and working them way through their way through there. <coughs> we also then uh, found that the valve that controlled that pipe, the bolts on it, had rotted, and the valve up the street decided to go at the same time as well. And so we had literally three different locations, although two in the one spot. So we went after the uh, where we, the break the break happened with so much force <coughs> it actually undermined the road and pavement fell. So it's a good thing it found was found when it did compared to the kind of traffic that we have on that road. Um, the police department were very instrumental in getting the road closed. I mean, uh, I know Eric knows. I've already told my guys, <coughs> my whole crew, including Christine, who stood out there till midnight because uh, Bruce is too old and went home at 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> um, to put that road back together, to get this thing fixed and back together, uh, you know, that's when you know you have a good thing going when that kind of thing happens and people make things happen without any complaint or uh, worries. And including CWD helped us because the one T that broke <coughs> was, we call it a 10, 10, 8, a 10 inch asbestos water line that runs up the, the main line. <coughs> the valve that broke was on that T. Nobody had that T as far as being able to buy it. Luckily, Champlain Water found one in their inventory. We've got two on the way now, one to give them back and one for us. But anyway, <coughs> in going after the holes, we were gonna fix just that section of pipe, which is what we normally do. And when we were standing out there, Christine and I, and I looked across the road and saw that that valve was going to have to get dug up, too. I was like, 
We're going to replace the whole line across the road at this point. So that's why we ended up having that whole road closed for that long time. I could see replacing <coughs> this section and then this now and then in the middle it go again. So we said the heck when we made that decision. We have to close the road again, which will happen next Wednesday. Notice is going out. Variable message boards will be out there tomorrow <coughs> on our social medias. If it's not already, it will be. Uh, it's going to be in the observer because they called me today asking me about it. So if you hear any complaints about it being rough or dusty or whatever, they're absolutely right. It's rough and dusty. Uh, we left it that way on purpose. That road is what, 4,000, 5,000 cars a day, 5% of trucks. We want to make sure that that's compacted before we pave it. <coughs> because when we pave it and it settles, we're going to have banging going on. And that's going to go on until they do the intersection work, which today I found out now it's 25, 26. So anyway, <coughs> I just wanted to put the plug in for that and, and let you guys know how impressed I was, and, and not because of me, but with the whole crew. They just <coughs> it's incredible to watch them step, step up and do their work like that. And like I said, <coughs> I wasn't kidding. I was called in here at 6 o'clock, stayed out there till 10. <coughs> and that's when they were backfilling and everything. And, you know, Christine stayed out till after it was all done and reopened. So we had people out there for 18 hours <coughs> on a 90 degree day. So anyway, I say that talking about our budget because we can't plan for those kinds of breaks. We put a $40,000 line item in here for main service line breaks. Before those breaks happened, we had five previous ones. So that $40,000 was already spent to the tune of $30,000. I still have a $10,000 bill coming, so I know that $40,000 is gone. And then whatever's going to happen out there on industrial labs, I figure is anywhere from $20,000 to $30,000 probably. Uh, it's not our biggest one. Uh, Terry and Ted have been around long enough that they probably remember uh, <coughs> French Hill, where we had one at ninety thousand dollars when we won there. So that's just one of those line items that we can't. We can pick any number and put in there; it doesn't matter. We just have to, you know, come up with our best guess, look back over years. So anyway, once again, there's not a whole lot of changes in here, but I'm more than willing to take questions and answer questions. Well, first of all, actually, I think, can you express to everybody the board's, you know, absolute gratitude for and appreciation for how hard everybody worked? I mean, that, that, that is incredible. And um, <clears throat> can tell them that we are genuinely impressed and genuinely grateful. So thank you. Uh, please, please do spread the word on that. I will, Ted. Thank you. So, um, questions? Questions or comments? Do you foresee more of these problems? Is, is this an old water line that? <coughs> now, the, the thing is that, uh, Mike, is our whole system isn't considered old. <coughs> and when we say that, we're talking 40, 50, even 60 years. But in the, in the world of utilities, <coughs> our system is not considered old. I don't know when those Foxwood condos went in. I'm sure I can go back and look and see. But uh, that ductile iron pipe is probably 30 years old, maybe. Um, the issue is <coughs> there was probably nothing ever done wrong when it was installed. Rocks just move. You're a farmer, you get to grow rocks, right? I mean, <laughs> Very well. <laughs> these rocks just sit around that pipe, and then when you have those trucks pounding up and down that road all the time, they're just sitting there wearing, 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 and they just bore a hole right through the duct line. We, <coughs> we've seen that before. Nine times out of ten, our brakes are bolts on valves. The, 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 the soil here just eating the bolts away. And that luckily, luckily, the second one out there, the second one up the road, <coughs> was that's all it was. The bonnet bolts were gone when they dug down. So ECI came in, one crew started working on it, and I was like, we're still going to have to do the other one. And this is six o'clock at night. Well, no, probably three in the afternoon. They got a second crew in and went after the other break for us. And they were done in two hours, three hours. 
Because all they did was dig down, and it was the bonnet bolts, three hanging up, replace the bolts, and we're all set and ready to go. But that's what most of our brakes are. Either bonnet bolts or service connections, with the saddles on the service connections, same thing, they just gotta keep in the way. I just wanted to point out a couple items for the board. I, I had in my memo here, um, you know, Bruce mentioned a main driver is this, the, the cost, the wholesale cost of nine and a half percent increase from the Champlain Water District. Um, and then, then other, other trailing costs we looked at for uh, operations and wages and benefits. But one thing to highlight in the debt service um, line item, um, the Lamplight uh, water line project replacement, we had initially planned for our, our bond repayment. It was a $2 million project. So we, we had budgeted when the loan forgiveness hadn't come in yet for last year's budget. So that, that has come in now and it forgave about half of the loan. So our bond payment has decreased uh, significantly in, in this budget moving forward. Um, from So looking at it this way, it's a, it was a $2 million project and the town is paying about, um, currently with the interest, that'll go down over time, um, just over $30,000 a year, um, over 30 years for that project. So it ended up being a really, really good opportunity for that the town jumped on there. So I, I mentioned that with, that kind of cancels out some of the other increases. And we've left in, in the proposal here, a capital project for the aforementioned Chamberlain Lane water line. So that, looking at these numbers, um, essentially that's where you can look at it, the majority increases from that project. So um, if the board wants to look at potentially, um, you, know, you have a proposal before you, if you want to defer that project or fund it partially, that's um, staff's thoughts. If you want to look to reduce the rate, that, that might be a place to look at here. Um, it's a $300,000 project. Um, it could be funded, um, you, know, you could split it over a couple of years, you could defer it. Um, you could think about using some ARPA funds for it, but I just show that for the board's uh, discretion as you're, as you're discussing um, this budget here. You could also just uh, have a negative balance budget, right? Right, um, so anything, um, anything in these will be, will be picked up by the uh, fund balance, but um, we're, we're not, per staff hasn't proposed the use of fund balance um, or net position based on where the water fund is and some of the, especially the recent history with some of these breaks, we, we, haven't, uh, we haven't put that in the proposal at this point, but it is the board's. Well, uh, I respect that, but this 1.7 million in the biggest project I just heard about was 90K. So unless you're planning on having 17 of these in one year, you're not really in any, any serious charges. <coughs> oh, by the way, with no FEMA recovery, which I think that there was a lot of water, you know, erosion kind of things that would blow up cause big problems, I would suspect would it be, it would be a bigger problem than just our fund balance. Mm -hmm. you know, so. I, mean, I guess uh, um, I appreciate actually that s staff gave some options because I would like to not see user fees go up more than the 9.5% um, that were being handled. See it capped, and I, I just feel back to Dimlo without taking any other chances, any other changes into account. That was only like fifty thousand dollars, so I think that would be reasonable to to say, hey, the uh, water district is giving us a nine point five percent. Here's all the reasons why they needed nine point five percent. It's the same reason your grocery bills are going up and your you know your costs are going up, and we need to pass the nine point five percent on. Um, so in terms of the Chamberlain Lane project, um, if we partially funded it this year and it brings that rate down by half of the, the proposed increase, we, the project would then be effectively deferred for a year, obviously because we wouldn't be able to fund it until next year fully. Um, what is your anticipated, like are, are we seeing the, the trend will, is gonna continue for, for cost of services? I mean, the project is estimated at 300,000 now. Is it next year, could it be 350? I mean, you know, like what's... So it's a good question. Uh, I don't think we're gonna keep seeing those kind of large increases, but uh, it's certainly never cheaper to do something than to do it now. <laughs> That $300,000 number I grew by $30,000 just based on the, the estimate we had uh, for that project was $270,000, but that was 2020 or 2019, something like that. So I just 
lose thirty thousand dollars more. I have to be totally honest. Uh, that it's not the end of the world if, if that one does get pushed. It's just one of those that's going to have to happen eventually. What happened there was <coughs> Indian Ridge was built, Brennan Woods was built uh, two separate times, and Brennan Woods had a larger water line. So there's a small section of water line between two larger sections, and that's what needs to be changed there. Were you really going to get it done this calendar year? I mean, exactly. Were you really planning on getting it done <laughs> this fall? I mean, I'm just wondering, is it really going to push it off a year, or was it going to get done next summer anyway, and you could just straddle it over? 2024, that, that's, that's the uh, beginning of next summer, sure. Why, we could, I mean, it's not a hard design to come up with. Yeah. It's a matter of whether we have money. But, but it's not a lot of permitting and stuff involved in it. So. That it could happen during fiscal year 2024, so by June 30th of next year, wherever this budget covers that. Yeah, it's, you know, it could certainly be done. We'd have, we'd have August now. We, they've already basically done a design. It'd just be a matter of cleaning that up and then funding the project. If you wanted to move any money from anywhere, that's the place to move money. <laughs> Paying now or pay more later, and uh, we've been kicking this can down the road since you said 2021, and uh, uh, needs to get done. In, in my mind, might as well do it now. It's a great, it's a great art project. <laughs> <laughs> I don't disagree. I just think it could come out of a unrestricted fund balance, the piece that we can't afford to get the number down a little bit to help. People who live in Williston are facing a lot of rate increases this year. I'm going to recuse myself from that decision because it is my neighborhood. So. <laughs> <laughs> are there other questions or comments before we start talking about our motion? Okay. So there is a proposed motion. The proposed motion would not um, take into account this point. Um, I think at this point I'll leave it at that. Ask if people want to make a motion, and if so, what the motion will be. So I'll make the motion, and if somebody wishes to amend it, that's uh, that's fine. But I'll move to approve the water fund operating budget for fiscal year 2024 in the amount of one million seven hundred thirty-nine thousand four hundred sixty-five dollars in capital program for fiscal years 2024 through 2029, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Is there discussion or amendment to the motion? <laughs> yes, I would like to amend the motion. Um, and I'm not sure exactly how to do this for staff staff benefit, but I would I would like to because it's a fixed number, so I have to take a number off of it. I, yeah, I think I, well, I think we should talk about that to make sure we get it right. But my understanding would be that you would make a motion with the reduced number. Everybody in the room knows where that reduction would come from. Um, but I suppose there could be a follow-up directive to staff as to where that, how the budget would be amended if your, if your amendment is passed. Because just talking about what I would like to see is I would like to see the, the user rate capped at 9.5. And then leave it to staff to figure out how to get that. Would, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm not criticizing. No, I think, I we do that. So, yeah, I, we I, do I, I mean, personally, I think it should come out. I don't know that we should pr hang the Chamberlain project on this. It's a 1.7 million dollar fund balance, but I don't know. I don't really have enough to stand firm on that direction. We're talking fifty thousand dollars. It's you know, it's not the end of the world. But so, Eric, what would what kind of amendment would help staff? <laughs> so let's let's see. So. It's approving the expense side of the budget for the bottom line of this, so that if we include the capital project in there, so essentially the expense side of the budget is the same number, but it sounds like it might be amending the revenue side of the budget. 
So I'm just talking this out here. Yeah. So <laughs> you're approving a bottom line, but you also need to approve um, encompassing how that budget is put together. So you, you may pass a budget for the bottom line, but offer an amendment to the reven how the revenue portion of that budget is is put together. And I didn't alter this, like pulled off the budget. Mm -hmm. Shirley, what was the first part of yeah, how you did the that? Big number that I had. Yeah, so I went to the user receipts, and um, just based on Gina's comment, she wanted it to see, to be about nine and a half percent, the same increase we were getting from the water district. So the FY24 proposed rate, I changed to eight dollars and fifty cents, and that made an anticipated increase of nine point six eight percent. So. We have proposed we have six dollars. Proposed rate of six dollars six dollars. Yeah. Changing law okay. Yeah. Sorry. Hold yeah. On. <coughs> Cost center four two one nine zero. Okay. So I proposed rate of eight point seven five eight dollars and seventy five cents. It, you're in the wrong fund, Charlie. Yeah, no, you're looking oh. at I had five dollars and thirty cents going to five dollars and eighty cents. I'm never brave enough to do this kind of stuff on the fly. Five dollars and thirty cents going to five dollars and eighty cents, so about ten percent, right? Yeah, nine point four three percent. Yeah. So and then five dollars and eighty cents times estimated billable gallons for FY twenty four. Would be million three hundred and seventy two thousand. Which is fifty thousand dollars less than fourteen nineteen. Yeah. So the bottom line is a deficit of fifty thousand. Right. So leaving Chamberlain Lane. Okay, good. Whew. It's my reputation on the line here. <laughs> well, my amendment is that we uh, amend Terry's number to be uh, $50,000 uh, lower than whatever number Terry just said. That was the motion. The net, and that I will, I would and that the user fees do not go up more than the water district rate goes up. And within those two parameters, Pat can figure out how to do it. Okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> to Thank you. Second to the motion. To the amendment as well. Does, does the, is the amendment clear in people's minds? Terry's number is not going to change because that's totally expensive. So we're not going to change expenses. We're just Okay. And increasing the deficit. So the motion wouldn't change. Oh, then we don't have to. Then we don't I have to vote it at all. We don't. Yeah, you're, you're approving a budget bottom line. Mm -hmm. So you could approve the budget bottom line, but I, I think. It's an expense bottom line, right? Yeah, an expense right. bottom line. So you're also approving the budget. So maybe a second motion would be in order to amend the budget proposal on the revenue side of the budget for those parameters. That might be cleaner. Um, so. Okay, so I withdraw my amendment. Okay, so if the amendment is withdrawn with the understanding that there's going to be a follow-up motion, um, 
there any further discussion on the motion? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Aye. And one abstention, I'm, I apologize. One <laughs> um, and then, uh, okay, so that, that passes and um, there would now be another motion. Okay, I move that, what am I moving? Am I moving the, 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 uh, the, the user fee number or the bottom line revenue number? What were the words you just used? <laughs> <laughs> um, something to the extent of amending the water fund budget, uh, the, the revenue um, basis of the water fund budget to reflect um, um, a rate a rate of X number and um, an increase of net position for um, the balance to make the budget balance. That's not a very clear motion. <laughs> no, <but laughs> that's the. All right, so I'm, I'm, I am uh, moving that we, uh, we're not amending the, 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 the rev we're amending the revenue that's in the basis of the budget that we just approved, well, the rest of the budget to set the user fee at For clarity, that would leave us in a $50,000 deficit position. Move the water. Which is the same increase as the Champlain water district fees. Passing on to us. So you move that the, well, I'm sorry, this is probably wrong and I apologize, but um, are you moving that the water budget, the revenue basis, will be amended to reflect a rate of $5.80 with Do we have to say more? Do we have to say more about the um, You may want to reflect what the use of net position is going to be um, and then again next week the board or next meeting the board will also approve the rate schedule but you're, you're essentially billing it in your budget you've adopted here how specific do we have to be with, um, reflecting the corresponding net position to, to balance the expense budget that was just approved yeah, or something like that? We, we've come we've come to this board before with a budget with a rate in it, and then that rate has changed when you when you've adopted the fees later on. Yeah. It hasn't always been. Voted on the budget, you resolve what you were going to say in the budget here, but then something's changed between now and when we send you the fee structure, and that fee structure has had a different number sometimes than what's been in the approved budget. And when is that coming? Uh, two, yeah. week, two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yeah, because we got to have them set by July one. So, is it a cheap way out to say that Gene's well, idea <laughs> can be implemented in two weeks? Yeah, we, we can put that if it sounds like if it's the consensus of the board, we can we can build that rate into the fee schedule, and then um, you know may, maybe maybe so we have the exact number of staff to come back with just amend amending the revenue side of the budget to reflect the net position use that balances that out. So we make sure all the all the numbers line up here the way way intended. What do, what do people think about that? I'd love to have this extended discussion again in two weeks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that works for me. Okay. Do I get to pull back my amendment again? Um, <laughs> Is that yeah, right? I, I think so. If we have consensus, if that's how we're going to uh, uh, deal with it. Do we, <laughs> do we have consensus on that? Okay. Okay. So, yes, we do. So, um, please, please do our work. And come back and tell us what our answer is. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it happen. Thank you, everybody, for listening to that. No, thank you. Good discussion. Okay, so that actually does take care of the water fund budget uh, item. Um, so thanks, everybody. Next on the agenda is the ordinance amendment for the temporary event. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Christine. Thank you for everything. Thank you, Bruce and Christine. I'll, I'll pull this up here. 
And actually, uh, Erin Dickinson's on the line, so she might, I might defer to her for some questions. She does most of the staff work on this, but I can provide an overview. Erin, I'm just going to give you talk permission if, uh, if you want to share anything as we go through this one. You might, might recall the board um, passed this ordinance last April and it came into effect last June. Um, it replaced the town's um, much um, overdated festivals ordinance that was put in place after Woodstock in 1970 or so. So it was, it was time to take a, another look at this one. Um, uh, we, we had one earlier this evening and share kind of our staff review process for these. Um, and as we, we've worked with it at the staff level, we proposed some edits to consider. And the question for the board this evening is whether you want to warn a public hearing on, on these proposals for, for further discussion. If you have direction for staff to uh, amend these proposals to then um, um, have that considered a warrant for your public hearing. Um, so Erin Dickinson, this is the manager. She's been the lead on this, working with the town attorney on, on language to consider. Um, would the board like me to kind of walk through the items in the memo um, or just take any specific questions yeah, at this so. point? Okay. So starting in Article 3, um, definition of temporary event, um, adding celebration to that. Um, we didn't have that before. Um, for the permit requirement, increasing the threshold from 25 to 40 people. Um, we, had, we had some feedback here um, requiring we're looking at these thresholds and research some additional best practices and trying to find a, a number that, that may, might make sense here. Um, and we've added a paragraph to the end to address specific provisions when a temporary event permit is required for events on town owned property that has leases or licenses. Um, this is kind of alluding to uh, the Catamount property. Um, <clears throat> we're kind of looking at this in tandem with the license agreement coming up as pre with the board at the end of last year, um, trying to work out the license agreement and trying to work through the temporary events in the project. Um, so this proposed language is to say, the ordinance will reference a, um, a license agreement on property, and then you'll, you'll likely see in the license agreement for, for that group um, uh, reflected the point back to the ordinance as well. So we're kind of sequencing those two here with bringing this ordinance to you, to you first, um, and that's, that's what prompted that proposed amendment here. Um, we had changed some changes to application requirements, um, allocating some more administrative time for review. Um, we currently set the select board review threshold at 100 attendees or more, um, and we're finding, um, proposing to increase that to go to the select board a bit and leave, leave lower than that to the manager um, as, as a proposal here. Um, also to include other approximate number of attendees in the application. Um, then the, the issue with the 500 feet for addresses, the, the idea to add some discretion in here was for large property like Catamount, if something's located in a certain part of the property, but you know, in um, 400 acre property, if there is some folks who are adjacent far away from where, where the event is and staff can help look at where those potential impacts might be, um, do we want to still mail everything out that abuts? Some um, question for the board here, but we've seen that come up where the actual event is taking place on part of the property where you have abutters who are a, a far away away from, from it as well. Um, just cleaning up some designee language for fire safety requirements for review. Um, so clarifying edits as well, some language regarding tents. And just some references back. Um, adding some language from, from fire. Um, and we also have this for um, manager and uh, police department. If events going on, events found to not be in compliant, what the permit was for, um, giving authority to revoke the permit um, at that point. Um, currently, it's um, the ordinance is written is just at the select board level. and. Pragmatically, if there's an issue with an event going on, we wouldn't be able to convene the board to make that decision. So trying to delegate that to other, other agencies in, in town here. Um, and just overall, uh, having this ordinance in place and with any piece of public policy, especially a, a new one, um, growing with it and learning with it after, over the first few months and year um, taught us some things to consider further. Um, and then also helping to, I think we're, Getting the word out more with this being in place, but trying to um, make people aware of this of this ordinance in town, and it's it's 
ultimately, um, remember this came about with looking for notifying folks of especially larger events going on, giving them an opportunity to share via comments about what's proposed for staff of the select boards that are considering the application. And also to make sure we allow for time for um, public safety review of these events. We want to make sure if events going on that um, police, fire, public works have reviewed it. Um, if any conditions for the permit are in place, it's um, um, for access and emergency personnel and to make sure those are those are addressed as well. So that's that's kind of the general walkthrough and open for questions from the board and um, I might ask Erin to chime in as well if uh, there's something I can't answer that she came across as she worked through this. I like what the two gentlemen earlier spoke about, you know, could we get that? You mentioned catamount 400 acres, you know, in the 500 foot. You know, what about somebody who has a 0.25 acre you know, residential area? Yeah, I think, I think with this, the way we drafted the language was to, for those larger areas, to leave some discretion to the manager if there was um, seeing where the event was, if notifying everyone didn't make complete sense for that event. If it's, if it's someone that, you know, a small residential area and there, there's many abutters right there, I, I wouldn't see wavering from that 500 foot rule. Um, it's kind of based on the location of the event and, and the terrain. And this was just building in some potential discretion. So it wasn't, um, if it made sense to not need to do that to that extent based on the property, that there was some discretion. So the discretion is really the it's not it's 500 feet from from the property line mm -hmm. as opposed from the event. So right. that's the discretion if if there's a significant difference there. So. Yeah, we, we thought about oh, do we want to stay 500 feet from where the event is taking place? But it just it administratively didn't right. make sense. So right. we have this large parcel. Okay, still 500 feet from this part of Catamount, but it's really far away from the event and is that something we want to still notify or not and building in some discretion to, for the manager to say well you know based on this and the event and the size of this parcel this these folks would be most affected by it to to notify them could you just find a way to make the the wording clear that the discretion is because the people you're not notifying are really going to be more than 500 feet away from the mm -hmm. impact something as opposed to it being interpreted to mean the quarter acre lots. Eric, can I chime in? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, I heard a, I heard a voice somewhere <laughs> that made me jump. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's so funny because this was something we went back and forth on multiple times, um, you know, trying to find a sweet spot. And as we're, I'm listening, I'm wondering if we can change the language to say for parcels over, you know, five acres, the manager can have discretion. So really it was interesting to hear the gentleman earlier um, because they were seeing it from the complete opposite end of why we had added it. It was really, you know, for the large, large properties. Um, so I don't know if maybe we could can consider that angle. Does that make sense? That makes sense. And I didn't follow the, the time, you know, the so many days for this and so many days for that as well as I should have, even though those are numbers. Um, the, I think the point the gentlemen were making is that the neighbors need to be notified in a reasonable amount of time, right? Not Friday before a Sunday event or something like that. And so I don't know where that could fit in that, yeah, you're out of time. If we don't have everything closed that we can notify the, the neighbors five business days ahead or something, but mm -hmm. some, some concept like that. Eric, can I chime in on that too? Yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> uh, so it, that also was interesting to hear them comment on because you'll see that the um, we extended the requirements by which applications have to come in with that in mind that we also needed more time to be able to notify abutters. So originally people had to submit applications within 30 days prior to the commencement of the event. And we changed that to 45 for the smaller events and 60 for the larger. With that in mind, we just need more time administratively as well. And I think as we were starting to have this ordinance in place last summer um, and people weren't necessarily familiar with it and might have had something planned, I. I left a little discretion about how to how to approach.
approach it is when people aren't aware of a new ordinance and to educate them and say, okay, um, you know, we can do it this time, make sure you notify people, but in the future, if this is in place, we need to have a communication on this, um, rather than necessarily tell them you couldn't hold your event just with a new regulation in place. So just try to try to use a little, just something new and trying to bring people along so they knew about it more in the future. And um, Certainly, um, we found, and, and Erin's done a great job with this as I've kind of delegated the, the keeper of the process here. So she's been very <laughs> thorough and um, moving these applications along and, and certainly sees some of these challenges from both the applicant angle and the, the administrative angle to, to, uh, to review these. I appreciate that this is a, you know, um, a, a trial tested um, process here. You know, that that's, I, I think that's important in that, that, you know, you all have responded to this kind of trial period and, and you've seen where room for improvements um, needed to be made um, in terms of administration, in terms of ease for the folks uh, applying for the permits and the folks affected by, you know, these events and things like that. So. Thank you very much for your work in amending this. I have one more question for Erin. <laughs> I'm listening and Greta, thank you. It was, a, it was an interesting exercise, so I appreciate that. <laughs> um, I, he, meant, uh, he mentioned that you could have one a month or something. I'm not really sure if I lived in a neighborhood, I'd be happy with someone having 50 people over once a month. But. So that was, um, yeah, we, we put in part for requiring a permit is to have a series. So, um, you know, one of the things was like um, uh, the Trucking Tuesdays at Adams Farm. That that actually a, a resident had commented to me who, who lived near there just asking about um, originally what, what regulates that. And before this ordinance, we just had some zoning provisions, but we didn't really have a lot of teeth to them. So... Um, you know, to that point with someone saying, okay, this series is going to happen, it's going to be adjacent to me, um, it gave them an opportunity to be notified about it and to come to the select board and say, you know, you might, this is challenging for me in my neighborhood, and um, please consider that when you're reviewing this, this application. So one of the requirements is for anything that's a series, um, it would need to go to the select board. I, um, and I believe we kept that language in there, right, Aaron? We didn't amend that. Yeah, that's um, that's correct. With the exception of the threshold change, would um, you know that's where it would be impacted. But the series is is we did not change. I can certainly see putting up with an annoyance for an evening, but if it's going to be every Tuesday night for the entire summer, that would probably test your expectations. So. Yeah, I wanted to create some some type of feedback loop for the policymakers, making hearing from folks to make those decisions. I do want to address, um, you know, the gentleman brought up the concern about 25 being too low, and that was something, again, we went back and forth on, and I looked at, you know, peer ordinances to kind of get an idea of what the threshold was. You know, I saw 50, 40, 100, 25 was definitely on the low end, um, and he cited, you know, parking concerns, which there's other ordinances, too, that are really complementary to cr trying to mitigate, you know, situations for neighborhoods and the noise ordinance is one, um, you know, the motor vehicle ordinance is another one. Um, and also just a reminder that um, one of the requirements, not just the threshold of, you know, minimum or maximum people, but the event cannot impact general um, public property or public rights of way or right of way. So, you know, when he mentioned about emergency vehicles not being able to get through that, regardless if it's two people or 150, you know, they, any event cannot cause that type of interference with public services. So by raising the threshold from 25 to 40, that does not change those type of concerns. The 25 actually, I mean, obviously I was here when we passed this. In, in, in retrospect, it seems it would, seems very low to me to begin with. I mean, you know, thinking about like families, that's, you know, families of four, that's, you know, whatever. Oh my gosh, I'm terrible at math. Six families, <laughs> essentially. Um, you know, and that could be a, like a, a bonfire in your backyard or whatever, you know. Um, and, you know, that would trigger, a, you're like, oh, it's Friday night, I'm going to have a fire. Like, you know, that you know, that, that does seem low. So I think I, I think the 40 makes complete sense. 
Yeah, we had some feedback of basically that's every Christmas party my family has ever had. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. And I, and I think that was like some, like Camper's uh, point was like, but I don't know how you write an ordinance. Like if it's a, it's a, it's a family celebration, yes, mm -hmm. but it's a, you're selling something or I don't know, whatever else people do, you know, have a festival in your backyard, that's different. But I don't know how you write an ordinance is that specific about what's a celebration and what's a, some other kind of event. And so I, I think Ford was great. Um, I don't have it open right now, but I believe there's a bullet saying if it's open to the public, uh, that's also one of the triggers. Right. Well, and I think that that also, you know, this is this is part of the process of, of, of the importance of having this process, though, is because then when they, you know, it, it, the, the neighbors could come and say, okay, well, somebody applied for, um, you know a monthly event in their backyard like you know they can come to us and, and we and say here's my concerns with this and we can consider those concerns effectively and have a process for doing that and saying no you can't do that or yes you can and, yeah. I, I wonder about you know a temporary event maybe only being one event if somebody wants to have repeated events they have to go through you know possibly the zoning department and get you know at least an administrative permit so that there is more questions being asked and more. Is that what you called the series a few minutes ago? Hoops to jump through. Yeah, the, yeah, the series would fall under this, but I, uh, I know I recall you might be familiar with that process, Mike, from, from your facility where if um, the administrative permit for kind of a host facility for um, a number of events and those aren't subject to this ordinance because it's been approved through zoning. Um, for, for example. Right, but temporary, I, I think of it as just one event. It's not a repeated event every, every weekend or every month. You know, maybe that should be triggering, a, you know, a, zo a zoning department a little bit more, you know, a little bit more stringent. I think we, we do have language in there that, that caps the, the number. Um, I think it might be eight or 10. I just have to look at it. Um, that's a lot of events to have for someone to have in, for temporary in their backyard. I think that was mostly intended for the purposes of like businesses, like again, like Trucking Tuesday, or if like Home Depot is planning to have workshops in their parking lot or something to that effect, then this could fall under that. But don't, don't those come to us? Isn't that? Yeah, that, and under this, yes, yeah. exactly, yeah. Well, why would someone in a residential neighborhood have an event 10 weeks? Ten weeks or ten months. Well, and again, that, like that's that's why they would come to us, and we could say why <laughs> why do you need to do that, or their neighbors could also say why do you need to do that. So even if it's thirty people, if it's a series of them, it has to come. If it's open to the public. If it's open to the public. Yeah. If it's open to the public, it should be going through the zoning department. Well, what's it? If it's why, more than one. Why wouldn't it come through us? process now is that that would come to the select board. Why would we have to set it through zoning first? I guess I don't follow that. I'm sorry. The, the proposed ordinance says that if this, if the conditions you're talking about are part of the permit, that the permit would have to be approved by us. So sure. we get to sit, we get to ask the questions and. Uh, well, technically the perm or the ordinance would say if it's 200 or more people it would go to you right now it's a hundred or by a manager the manager could choose to forward it to you as well oh okay all right well that's interesting that's how it was structured previously as well with the exception of the um people threshold we are recommending increase so if there's a series of events that's open to the public that would not automatically come to the select board unless other criteria um, are met. Let me double check. Amplified sound. I've looked at this enough times you would think I'd have it memorized, but I am not. <laughs> A little bit more than just a temporary event. Sounds like we're getting into commercial. 
you know, applications here. Can I ask, while people are looking for that, just procedurally, if if we did put this on the agenda as a and ask and warn a public hearing, if we have the public hearing, the input from the hearing makes us want to revise the proposed ordinance, then we kick it back to staff and warn another hearing. So we're, there'd be a delay, but we're not we're not really voting on passing this tonight. We're talking about whether we're going to have a hearing on it. Right. You're you're deciding what you want to warn for public feedback essentially and then the board can take that feedback and decide if it wants to change what the proposal is um, and repeat that process and that's why I have a good process because I didn't think of didn't think of the concerns that came up so yeah mm -hmm. so it's I think it's important uh, that uh, for you to know that Mike Kanfer is a former member of the select board uh, he's been involved with a, a temporary uh, event in his own neighborhood over the uh, you may have seen this uh, elsewhere in the, with the bulldog situation in lamplight and it's created a huge controversy within the lamplight development and he's brought forth you know his concerns and it seems to me that uh, we could take this up and uh, refer it back to staff and take it up at our next meeting with uh, comments regarding his comments and uh, answers to his questions that may not satisfy him, but I think it would give us a way to go forward with, with this. I know everything in uh, town government is time sensitive, but how time sensitive is, is this? I mean, um, I, I think that would work just fine. Um, you know, we're we're kind of we're coupling this with the Catamount uh, license agreement review. Um, we'd like to if the board considers amending the ordinance first, uh, especially pertaining the language of referencing a license agreement. Um, that the board considers action on that before you consider the license agreement. So we would we would just kind of push that timeline back. So it's it's not critical that we hold the hearing on July 11th. We could we could move it to another meeting in July, depending on your next discussion, and just puts the license discussion another meeting after that or so. That might make sense, given the concerns that we're... He just had a different lens on it that was just yeah. worth considering. I think yeah. staff could put that lens on it. So too. could we ask, would it make sense to ask the staff to look this over again in light of the comments and, uh, and for that matter, our comments? Yeah. Eric, I'm back, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks. Um, yeah, maybe jump there for a second. I think, I think it would be valuable, yeah, to have language in there or to change the language in there in terms of specifying when it gets sent to us. Like, and so if it sounds like everybody, you know, feels like if it's going to be a series of events, that would, that that maybe triggers that um, thing. The only reference I saw to the series is in the definition of a temporary event, um, and so. That was, yeah, that was the only time I noticed it um, specifically. But if we, under, you know, under the, the part, you know, where it outlines, again, more than 200 people, that would push it if we could put some language in there around this as well. Um, series. Yeah, Article 10, Section B, if you added, um, you know, anything that occurs more than once also triggers select board review, that would be an easy edit to that section. Yeah. I do have one hard, fast veto on this, though. What's that? It's my monthly, somebody spelled my name wrong. <laughs> <laughs> that was the attorney. <laughs> <laughs> it is the third time in three months. <laughs> I think it's three different spellings, though. So that It's got to be spell check. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I think you would laugh, Aaron. <laughs> well, yet another reason to postpone it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> We're not there, Tom. Okay, so I think I think it's consensus that we're going to ask staff to take another look at this, and we'll take it up in our next meeting or whenever we're. Yep. Available. Yeah, we'll we'll look at the the comments. Thanks for the comments tonight from the board, and we'll, we'll we've got the comments from the residents as well, so we can we can respond to those those concerns and, and address them uh, in a memo. Okay, great. Okay, so with that being 
set, let's move on to the next item, volunteer reappointments. So every, every year the board um, in June gets a list of reappointments to town boards and commissions. Um, we included that list in the agenda. The town's practice has historically been to um, confer with incumbents who have been appointed to see if they're interested in continuing to serve. Staff reviews their service um, with our volunteer policy to see if there's any concerns there. Uh, we generate this list of folks who, who wish to be reappointed um, for the board's consideration. Um, and then through this process, we, we find people who are not interested in being reappointed, and then we re-advertise those now open positions for the board to re-interview to fill those slots. So this is the first step in that process each year. Um, we have, for your consideration, the listing included with the agenda. Um, I will note that we just found out yesterday that Alex Daly on the Planning Commission has um, needed to step down in, in July due to other commitments. So um, should you consider approving the list this evening, it may make sense to um, amend the list to remove Alex Daly's name from it. <clears throat> Questions or discussion? Somebody can who is stepping down? Yep, um, he's he gave his, his resignation from the Planning Commission yesterday. Oh. So we had his name to be reappointed for July 1st, but we won't need that anymore. Is it usual to have um, um, members of staff on this to be reappointed to board? Yeah, they're um, repres I, those are the regional planning ones, I, I think. And um, yeah, it's typically staff has, has served in those roles. Not necessarily optional. For That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> But we do appoint them. We appointed yeah. Eric to something today, so I guess it makes sense. Um, we move to reappoint for another term the individuals currently serving on town and regional boards and commissions who have expressed an interest in continuing with their service as indicated in a report dated June 6, 2023, with the exception of Alex Daly, who will be resigning. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion on the motion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay, the ayes have it. Okay, that brings us up to manager's report. Eric. So we uh, handed out this evening, um, Aaron's prepared this. Um, so for the new board members, we'd like to do a quarterly report um, that looks at perform um, different indicators for town services after every three months. So you've got um, the January to March report um, distributed this, this evening. Um, so that's a report each department had put together for you to, to review. And um, we did a, a look at this maybe the end of last year um, on formatting and what's most helpful for the board for these indicators. So it, it's certainly a, a living and working document um, that we can um, change from time to time as well. We like to try to be consistent with the indicators over a period of time so we have some benchmarks for the board to look at. But um, as you review this, if, if you want to, um, if you have any suggestions for changes uh, to staff, please, please let me know. We can continue to, to look at this and make it most effective for the board and, and how, you re how you review these, uh, these benchmarks from throughout our fiscal year here. And then Shirley, um, the financial report through February, and I know I just distributed that this evening to, to the board. Uh, I know, Shirley, was there anything you wanted to, to highlight from that report? for the Tatro property, this was really our property, were processed in February um, after formal action of the Board of Abatement. So that was 11,000 in uh, property taxes, 11,000 in interest sales and meals and brooms. Um, local option payments are currently running 225,000 for the first two payments above what we predicted for each of those quarters. Um, Looking at the clerk revenue, um, the uh, recording fees are presently running less than budget, and we expect that to continue. There's just not as much activity. So right now, my best estimate is that revenue will fall 60000 for the budget. Um, 
looking, I'm going to the second page and the, the last bullet leads to the highlighting. The host counties, I've estimated those as well. And based on the current um, projections, that line item will be 10,000 um, shy of budget. <coughs> and that, that is following um, the last couple years of history that we, it, it's declining slowly as more, um, um, I should say, as less is going to Casella, because that's the majority of it is for Casella, as less is going to Casella and more is being recycled. So that's a good thing, but affects us uh, financially. Um, the total cost for the removal of the Pedro trailer that were unbudgeted were $28,500. So I just added a new little um, paragraph at the bottom. So the sum of all these variances to date are 105,000 favorable, and that's coming from the local option tax. Um, so as we look to year end, we had approved the ARPA money for the police retention, and so if things pull through, we will, we will be able to reallocate or unallocate that ARPA money for police retention and um, put it back in the pool and hopefully just be able to use favorable budget variances at the end of the year. So, and that is something that we will, um, of course, we do after all the numbers are in. Um, nothing, nothing significant in water, sewer, stormwater, um, enterprise funds to point out. And I know you discussed these, so um, may or may not have questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for adding the kind of outlook pieces. <laughs> And you put that. your first paragraph down too. I did. Oh, you so, did? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. Questions for Shirley. You, is the ambulance revenue low because of Medicare reimbursement? No. Um, so the city of Barrie, um, who used to do our ambulance billing for us, um, with less than the notice in our agreement, um, told us that they would no longer provide the billing service. It was a one-person operation, and that person left. So left us high and dry and going through an RFP process to find a new billing service. So we've done that, but that transition has taken a while. There's a lot of paperwork to do, a lot of applications um, for all of the different insurance providers that you know we have to give authorization to. ECP is our new billing service. Um, and just trying to catch up on those balances that were outstanding, have them move those over, uh, provide the payment information to them so they know the current balance. So with all of that, um, they have now started billing. So they, um, our last billing was November 30th. So they are catching up on that billing, getting billing out. So the end of April, we started getting payment back in. Um, Maine has been more active, so you know my, my goal is that, or my dream is that, um, with the ambulance revenue and the accounting rules, we can look at what comes in in July and August um, for for FY23 and bring that revenue back into FY23. So so that I, I believe that we'll be at budget by the time, at least at, at budget, if not a little bit more by the time our year is actually closed. But it's really doing for the due to the fact that our ambulance billing service dropped us because they didn't have a provider anymore. It was a one-person operation. So so awful that it happened, got us to a better place, something that was on our to-do list, and now we have an entity with multiple people and redundancy. So we're at a better place at the end of the day. Thank you. You're welcome. Stormwater fund maintenance operations at 282%. That is um, the uh, Lyman, Lyman Drive. Um, that was due, that's a stormwater um, event issue. So it is um, in our expenses. It will be capitalized at the end of the year, but we're also um, have applied for FEMA, FEMA funding, funds. And that's been approved at a higher 90% reimbursement rate, um, a higher state and federal rate. So. We should be able to get most of that. I haven't booked anything because I'm waiting to yeah. see if it comes in before year end. Um, so if it's not in, I will book a receivable. So we'll have revenue that offsets the majority of that. 
That was, that was my inside baseball question. Is it, do you take this spending out to a FEMA grant or does, do you add the revenue? I add the re I'll add the revenue. Yep. You two talk the same language. We do. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand. Right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Sure. Just you're welcome. Eric? So, um, also share our phase two of our community spaces outreach survey. Um, we'll be launching later this week. Um, the steering committee's done a, a lot of good work with interviews and designing this second wave of survey. So we'll have that out later this week and open for about three and a half weeks. Um, Aaron's been taking the lead on that. So get, get that out. The observer might be running something on it this week. They asked me just for an update. So I'm gonna get the word out to people and get them to be engaged in our, in our data gathering for that, that big project. Um, and then logistical item, so there's a little bit of a delay in finishing our grand list, and that's needed to set the tax rate for FY24. Some delays with some new state software. So I checked with town assessor Bill Himmon this week, and it'll be completed June 23rd, which originally had the tax rate to be set at the June 20th meeting. So it looks like we'll need a special meeting, unfortunately, the week of um, June 26th um, to set the tax rate, and it's important to set it before July because we have we have to get the bills out by July 15th and the holiday and everything because they're due August 15th. So I um, want to see the board's availability that week for a quick special meeting. Um, Tuesday the 27th, the DRB does have a warned meeting in, in this room. Um, we might be able to work around that if that's the best night, but um, to see what, the, what would work for the board that week if we need a call to call a meeting here. Whatever works for me. Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday work better for me than mm -hmm. I can't do it on a Thursday. It, it, it's too. It's uh, the timing is wrong to do it on the twentieth. Yeah, we'll need um, to be able to set the rate. We need the grand list finished, and the grand list won't be done until the twenty third. So it'll have to be sometime after the twenty third to set the rate. And then your first meeting in July is July eleventh. That'd be too close to when we need to send the bills out to get them. The meeting doesn't have to be here, right? I mean, we could meet in the fire department. We've done that in the past. Yeah, yeah, we could meet. If it's Tuesday, we, we could meet there. We could meet in the planning office, too, next door. Yeah. I'm willing to offer a table at the farmer's market. <laughs> <laughs> Kicking it old school. So whatever works. OK. Um, you want to say Wednesday the 28th, then we could start earlier, potentially, too? Um, that would work better for me. Six o'clock work that night. What on Wednesday you said? Yeah, Wednesday the twenty eighth of June. Yeah. It's fine with me. Okay. And uh, probably just like be that one agenda item, so it could be a yeah, it could be a brief opening thing discussion. Good. Um, okay, and th then finally, um, a little more of an update here and, and chatting with Ted. I'm sure folks are monitoring the, the hotel voucher program in, in, this, in the state and um, the impact on the folks experiencing homelessness in, in our county and statewide. So I, um, Aaron and I have been engaged in regional discussions uh, concerning this with fellow municipalities, the Homeless Alliance in the state of Vermont. Um, it's, it's furthering an already challenged and strange system, um, the situation. Um, we have regional organizations that are looking to expand outreach capacity. I'm also working to see how Wilson can assist with that outreach with, with those partners. And um, I've been looking to see what potential role the town uh, could have to explore a temporary shelter being stood up in Wilson. As a government entity, we don't have the capacity to run or oversee such a facility. Um, but the state of Vermont is currently working to procure services from a third party vendor to run existing at any um, future facility shelter spaces in the state. So I, I, I was on a call with this this morning. I, I ran this scenario um, and asked the state this. The state could be potentially involved in overseeing a shelter contract for a space. So for to run by the board this evening. Um, I could see the town potentially playing a role to work to identify if there's a possible location to stand up a temporary shelter, um, approaching building owners to gauge interest. Um, I received some criteria from the state that they'd look for in, in such a space. If there was interest, um, I could work to connect the building owner with the parties from the state to discuss further and what a temporary use arrangement would look like um, and help to determine the need and appropriate service scope in the town. Um, should something be established, the town would then be a stakeholder to assist in the ongoing evaluation of those services. 
but to look for the day-to-day -day management and operational um, management would need to be the state of Vermont and its subcontractor for such a facility. Um, we kind of have the capacity with, with our staff to do that. Um, sort of the city of Barrie is approaching this similar. They have a municipal facility that they've um, approached the state about, the Barrie Outdoor Rink or BOR next to the auditorium um, for a temporary shelter, um, looking to see if the state could provide um, assistance from a third party to, to staff that and, and oversee that. Um, so trying to think of a potential role the town could have as, as kind of a connective tissue here to help address this on a temporary basis. Uh, certainly the um, people, for people experiencing homelessness, uh, the larger root issue is the availability of, of housing and the board's had discussions about that recently about how to, how to look at that further in town, but that's certainly a longer term approach. Um, hearing on the call this morning, we know some folks um, are, are no longer uh, residents in hotels with this program's graduating when, when that will end for folks. Um, more over the next month or two. Um, try, I want to bring to the board this evening after talking with Ted to see if, if there's a consensus from the board to want me to explore this as kind of a facilitator to help these conversations occur. I, I don't know if there's a place in town that would work, but we could endeavor to see if we could connect some people to see if that might might be able to happen. But bring, I know it's late in the meeting now. We got some managers report. And, you know, this is a, this is a larger, large topic, but um, just, I propose that to the board this evening. Just to give some context to this as well, um, I am and Angela Arsenault um, were able to meet with some folks from the planning, Matt and Melinda from the planning office a, a couple weeks ago um, to kind of get a, an idea of what was going on. Um, I can report that, that, that the planning office has had some people walk in, um, which has never happened to them before and say, you know, I'm, I'm about to become unhoused. Um, you know, we, we need, do you have support, do you have resources, what, what do you have? And unfortunately, again, the, the housing is very limited. Um, I did attend um, an online meeting with the um, Chittenden uh, Homeless Alliance um, as well. And uh, this is really a regional problem. There are, uh, you know, most of the, Residents of the, the motels um, that, that are uh, about to become unhoused were, were primarily in Colchester and I want to say Winooski, but that is not necessarily where they will, you know, end up. They, you know, and it's not, uh, you know, some folks have, have said, well, they're probably going to go to Burlington, but, but w Williston also plays a, a role in this, and we do have a plethora of resources and amenities here in town. So there's no true way to gather, you know, how many folks will come here. What we do know is that a lot of these folks um, have disabilities. There are also a significant amount of uh, folks with um, children and families who are about to become unhoused as well. Um, and there are the regional, you know, folks that we would typically go to, cots and things like that. There, you know, they they are at capacity, um, and they are working to make some additional unit available here and there. But it's it's all stopgap and. They are handing out tents, um, you know, and sleeping bags. But again, that is not um, a viable solution, you know, by any means. Um, and so, I very feel feel very passionately that Williston needs to step up and, and be a leader in this and do whatever we can to support um, this and to be a partner. And to so, yes, I would. I personally would very much like to see Williston. Um, to do what we can to, to see if there's a way that we can provide temporary shelter. Just timing wise, I mean, this is kind of a crisis now, but kind of the process seemed like you were laying out, Eric, it's gonna be a while before we get anything online. Yeah, and I was, you might see the Burlington is looking to repurpose a state office building temporarily um, through December, and the state has some funding available um, to, to grant out to assist with, with these efforts in the short term. But um, exactly for, for us, it would take um, me probably working with staff here to see, are there some locations in town that may be considered, and then reaching out to the folks who own those facilities and um, having a conversation with them about how the state may be able to assist in um, coming in to be a, be a tenant to run something on a temporary basis. Mm -hmm. 
but um, I don't have a good sense on what the timeline would be exactly. Um, you know, it hinges on also the state procuring a, a third party to assist um, any potential space in Williston and, and regionally and statewide to, to staff these, these locations. And um, I think, you know, if we can find something that works, uh, you know, if all these pieces line up, and then I would think the state funding would need to, would need to tie into this um, to, um, to provide the, the landlord with um, some compensation for leasing the space. And um, there's a lot of boxes to check here, yeah. but I guess that the first step is seeing is there a potential option in town, um, but not knowing exactly what that trajectory is gonna be for a timeline. Um, I know Burlington, um, on the call this morning, they're, they're trying to assess if, if that funding is approved from, do a temporary at the uh, state-owned office building there that they may look to sunset it in the winter months when the uh, cold weather program kicks in for, for folks as well. But, you know, it's certainly these are kind of temporary stop gaps and you know, the larger solution is more affordable housing, regionally. But I'm trying to see what, what the town can do right, right. now. I, this is not a temporary problem. This is a permanent problem. This is not a temporary solution. This is a permanent solution, you know, realistically looking at this, you know, and that may not be popular, but it's kind of WCAX calls this the shoplifting capital of Vermont. Hmm. This is bigger than a Williston problem. So we're trying to think yeah. to Greta's point. Yeah. Yeah. This is, I mean, it's a, it's a statewide problem, um, obviously. And, uh, yeah, and again, you know, the amount of families and children and, and um, individuals that would be impacted by this is, is, is very large. Um, and so, yeah, I think I, I think it's imperative that, that, we, that we find temporary housing while we are exploring long-term resources. And I think that you know, we have taken some steps as a, as a select board to, to address some of these things. And I think this speaks to the import of standing up a house, housing committee as soon as we can so that they can help facilitate you know um, you know getting more affordable housing in town and things like that and working with partnerships there may be opportunities to get you know um, agencies in in to build more affordable housing units in hotels that maybe are looking for new owners or something like that in town um, as we've already done once and we've seen that that model works um, but but this is a need that needs to be addressed now. You know, the, our, the other solutions we're working on through planning and zoning are longer term solutions. Um, this is a this is a Im very immediate need that needs to be addressed. Yeah, I I agree. And actually, Greta, thank you for taking steps on this. Um, I I never responded to your email. I got caught up, and I apologize to you for that. Um, but uh, thank you for your your leadership and passion on it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the consensus here. I think that if we, you know, whatever we can do, we should. Um, and one of the difficult things that we have here is that we are a town, and this is a regional problem, and it's actually more than even a state problem, it's a national problem. Um, and it's a confluence of events. It's a confluence of not building housing that should have been built statewide. Um, it's a question of affordable wages it's a question of a whole bunch of different things that are all happening at the same time um, I do want to caution that you know we are you know the town can only do so much um, and that we you know we, but serving as connective tissue and trying to figure out if there is a way that we can do this I think is, is you know we got to do we got to do what we can you know I mean if, if you're fighting a fire and all you have is a couple glasses of water on yourself throw, throw them <laughs> you know don't don't just don't just sit there that well um so I, I think it's i think it's a good idea and you know if if the odds are remote that this is gonna go anywhere um uh so be it but um as has been explained to me any number of times in sports um you you, you don't make any of the shots you don't take so um so it sounds like we have consensus to try to go along with trying to be the connective tissue and explore the issue and see if there's something that we can't facilitate setting up. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll start working with staff tomorrow to try to see if, you know, where a potential location could be and then personally reach out to the, uh, the owners of those and, and yep. try to try to facilitate a conversation, at least get a, a dialogue going, get the right people at the table. Great. Okay. Good. Any 
anything else from the manager's report? That's all I have for manager's <laughs> reports. Um, other, other business? There is one thing after other business, but is there any other business? Yep, a catering permit um, June 22nd at Isham Family Farm, Wild Heart Distillery. Um, staff has no objections to this um, at the event. It's, <coughs> they don't say a lot on here, Mike, but you remember what <laughs> that is on. Yes, my, my, my wife has the Williston Community Theater, a little shop of horrors, <laughs> and that's the, you know, the initial night, it's a gala. Well, that's why the location name is called Isham Horror, so I thought oh. that was a typo. <laughs> <laughs> location name says Isham Horror, so I thought, well, I don't know what, I'm not going to, I don't know what that means. So. <laughs> but, it, but it's a little shop of horror, you know, it's just a theater. And it's, you know, it's just a, they set up, a, you know, some micro distillery sets up a bar. So, so this, this permit would be for, for that event from the vendor Wild Heart Distillery. Yes. I'll move to approve. Second. Further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed nay. The ayes have it. Do we have an abstention? We have one, able one, to one, one abstention. I, I heard no sound from Mr. Isham, therefore it was an abstention. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah. Eric, anything else? Uh, nope. That's all I have. Okay. I'm sorry, because I just made this other business or because you mentioned it. Were we going to have a uh, charge from the housing next? Next yep. Yep. Event. I've got that. Um, I've got a draft from staff, and we'll um, tend to plans to have it on your agenda at the June twentieth meeting. Yes. And then the last item is um, uh, the brainstorm of Jean, um, and uh, wanted to talk about it and see what people think about it. I thought it was a good idea. Is it? Um, Jean pointed out uh, a couple of weeks ago that it might be good to have a kind of a catch net at the end of our meetings so that if there are issues that came up and that uh, board members you know, think about for a while uh, as the meeting goes on, um, that at the end of the meeting it might be some, it would be an opportunity to um, uh, briefly and succinctly um, uh, have a final thought and perhaps a request for uh, follow-up from staff uh, so that uh, things that, Issues that do come up uh, in a meeting um, don't get don't get lost in the shuffle. So, um, so that's what the uh, agenda item is. Uh, agenda item 15. But Jean, did I did I get that fundamentally perfect. right? Yes. Well, perfect is strong. Um, but I always think of a hundred things. Yeah. So anyway, uh, that it theoretically would be related to what we talked about. Rather yeah, than I, I'm going to say that that's. Uh, I think that's something that would have to be pretty generally enforced. Is that this is not it's not a, a brainstorming session. It's something that if there's an item that came up in the meeting that we want to bring up again uh, briefly to basically, and as I'm envisioning it, to instruct staff uh, to give us a follow-up uh, and make sure that it doesn't get lost and that you know any questions can be uh, covered. So anyway, that being said, are there any final thoughts on agenda items from this meeting? And it's okay if there aren't. It doesn't mean I wish we I weren't. did. I have to bring that along. I know. I know. Uh, but next time. Casey, can you use the Zoom survey when it comes out? <laughs> yeah. Wait, even if I already answered the other one? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good to know. This is, a, this is the, the first part was the kind of qualitative piece. This is going to be the more quantitative data that we're looking for. We've narrowed it down and we're trying to really finalize what we're going to give to the um, architects and the design company so that they can then present us with options. I, I, I thought that the, the I don't know, I'm not very well at, good at saying things very well sometimes, so, that, so I'm a little blunt. But I thought, you know, that the agenda of questions, they weren't really open-ended questions that they asked, you know, in the interviews. They didn't ask for your opinion. They kind of gave you an answer and just expected you to nod up or down. What are you, what are you referring to, Mike? Well, Greta was talking about on the, 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 survey. the community oh, so okay. oh, right. okay. center scoping and library assessment. Was that what you were talking about? Yeah, yeah. They were, it was all uh, interview style. That, that was, so I don't know who you spoke with, but um, it was all interviews by a style meant to be open-ended and so. I, I can't speak to. <laughs> yeah. The next part will not be open-ended. It will be 
I didn't feel know. like they were open and I didn't feel like they were open questions. Okay. Any other final thoughts? Okay. Uh, if there are none, then we are adjourned. <laughs>